Testing one, two, three. Testing. Okay, testing. Keep keep going. Keep going. Okay, testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. All right, hopefully the sound is working and everyone can hear. And then you can continue on with the meeting. Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. Ashley, could you talk in the microphone there? Testing, one, two, three, testing. Testing, one, two, three, testing. Testing, one, two, three. Testing. Testing, one, two, three. Testing. Testing, one, two, three. Testing. Yep. Yeah. Testing, one, two, three, testing. Testing for sound. Testing, one, two, three. Okay. Testing one, two, three. Okay, Mark and Robin, I appreciate the work that you're doing. I think you have a new link that is showing in the other room. Please uh, check the volume and let me know if we are a go. All right.
right, testing, one, two, three. Testing for sound. Are you ready for liftoff? Nothing yet? Oh, boy. Okay, thank you. Testing, one, two, three, testing. I'm not worried. Testing, one, two, three. Five, 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 I'm less than one, two, three. Testing. All right, Mark. I see you have a, the video showing in the other room. Uh, please let you know if you can hear our voices through the speaker. Testing for sound. I see Jude is at the door. Testing for sound. One, two, three. Now we're waiting for Mark. Testing for sound. Testing for sound. Testing. All right, Mark. Do we have video and audio? Testing for sound. Thanks for Testing. checking, Mark. We're just giving you a little test for audio and visual. Testing. Can you, can you hear okay, pretty good? Thumbs up. Thank you, Jude. All Thank right. you, Mark. Thank you, Robin. Appreciate your patience and people working to solve this technical issue. So Jude, you can hear us okay? Yes. We are all set. The volume's low on the TV, but we can hear it. The volume's low on the TV, but we can hear it. Okay. Yeah. All right, so I just finished uh, reading. We are on a section, public comment session, agenda items only. So at this time, public comments are invited uh, for those Sorry. Right, we already read this. Um, I don't know if everybody heard me in the other room, so I was just I was going to repeat that. Um, please, um, when speaking, identify yourself. Speak clearly and loudly enough for everyone in the room and overflow room to hear you. Appoint a spokesperson if a concern is a group concern, and if necessary or desired, you can supplement your presentation with any additional information, personal comments toward a member of the community towards school staff or the Board of Education will not be appropriate. Um, and Dr. Graham, I don't know if you want to repeat what you were you were saying so that everyone can hear it. Okay, Jude, how's the volume? I'm, we're going to keep moving forward. Okay, well at least, at least we have volume and video, so thank you very much. Again, ladies and gentlemen, I was sharing with the group here, and uh, before we get interrupted with technical and audio issues, I'm just going to repeat what I've already shared so that the people in the other room and the people online can uh, understand. 
what we are about. So uh, I really just want to make sure that the community knows that first we appreciate you coming out to voice your concerns today and that we actually do feel and understand the pain and aggravation associated with this pandemic as well as your, your frustration with the school's hybrid model. As many of you know, I have a son here in school. He's a junior. Uh, the board members around the table all have children in the school system. And we really all want what you want. We all want our children exposed to high quality, in-person teaching and learning every day. We all know the negative impact, a reduced opportunity for in-person teaching and learning, socialization has on mental health as well as the potential for academic growth. We're working every day to ensure that we follow the requirements of the New York State Education Department and the Department of Health in order to maintain the health and safety of our students, faculty, staff, administrators, and everyone's families in our entire organization, including yours. I just wanted to share that information as I know many of you will want to address with us tonight your concerns. So I thank you for being here. And Ashley, I would also suggest that since we have people who have signed up for uh, agenda items to talk about, as well as general items, that we invite everybody who has signed up to speak in one session. If the board is okay with that, excellent. So, Ashley, take it away. Okay. Um, I also just wanted to, we're calling um, Cheryl uh, Reamer first, uh, Reamer first, and I wanted to remind uh, the board we cannot interact or respond at this time. We listen, um, direct administration to further answer questions and take notes. Um, but I also wanted to remind the public that we, we as board members, we can listen, but we can't, unfortunately, we cannot respond um, to you directly at this time. My name is Cheryl Reimer, and I am a resident of Grand Island and presently have two grandsons enrolled in the elementary school. But I'm also a New York State licensed teacher with 30 years of experience, and I'm a COVID-19 survivor. I'm here tonight to speak respectfully, respectfully and directly to the Board of Education and Dr. Freya. My question is, I don't understand why our public schools are not open to full-time in-person learning. Parochial schools and other school districts citing Niagara Wheatfield, which I was previously employed by, and Sweet Home have found their way. Why not us? To board members, are you actively seeking and researching what we still need to do to make this happen? Are you actively finding out what makes these other schools successful? Since you're a board member, are you walking around our school halls, listening to the daily struggles, Visiting successful schools in other in other districts, or at least the parochial schools in our immediate area, to glean possible solutions, or are we just settling? Yes, your job is difficult, but this is about our children. The American Academy of Pediatrics has stated that it is a priority to have our children in classroom learning. The safest place for many of our children is in the school in order to meet not only their academic needs, but like you said previously, nutritional, social, and emotional development. You, we can't be blind to the issue that not all of our children have a safe home environment to meet those needs. We need our children in classroom full time to grow, learn, and thrive, not just to survive this pandemic, this situation that we have been in is severe, and we need action now. For the sake of our children, their family, and the future, I truly believe you can and must do better. With answers out there, science, and the CDC supporting that it is safe to return to full-time learning in the classrooms, I'm asking you to consider the gravity of not having in-person learning. For all of that, there should be nothing more than finding a way to meet our children's need and grow. You need to put an end to neglecting the educational needs of this community and work tirelessly until a solution is found. 15 seconds. Thank you. I'm done.
Good evening, ladies and gentlemen of the board, and Superintendent Graham. I am Brian Bainey, and I reside at 2026 Long Road. I'm a parent of two boys in the Grand Island Central School District, and I'm also a teacher myself. Sir, I'm uh, working in the, at Winchester Elementary in the West Seneca Central School District. My son, Simeon, is in third grade, my st is student, and a student at, at Cuth Elementary. My son, Titus, is a kindergarten student at Char uh, Charlotte Sidway Elementary. I would first like to thank you for taking the time to listen to the parents, guardians, concerned community members of the children that you have been entrusted to uh, for their education. As a parent and a teacher, I feel like I, I can share a unique perspe perspective on the education during this time. First, as a parent, I want to see my children, your students, to have the best opportunities to receive the greatest education that our teachers can provide. In the current model of education, there is no possible way that you can say this model can be labeled as the greatest education that this school district can provide to my children, as well as to, as well as to the rest of your student body. Please do not misconstrue that statement. I know that the teachers that are employed in this district are doing everything in their power to provide the best education that they can under the circumstances that they have been thrust into. But it is not the greatest education that they can provide. And this leads me to my next perspective as a teacher. As a teacher, I have a great privilege to pass along my knowledge to future generations of our society. I never know what my students will do with their life, and that is an exciting aspect of my profession. But it is my responsibility as their teacher to provide them with every opportunity to learn what I know so that they may one day use it to benefit the generations to come. My district is currently using a hybrid education model as well. Teaching under this model, I know personally but I am unable to provide my students with the greatest education that I can give them. I am limited in so many different ways that I do not have the time to get into each in, in detail. But please listen and understand. As an educator, I want my students in the classroom. I would love to have my students back with me, to see them grow, to see them struggle through a hard task, and then the pride that is in their eyes and on their faces while they, when they are successful. I would like to request of you to consider returning my children, your students, to a full in-person education. There is no substitute for this. Every child will benefit from a decision in this favor, as well as our community. Personally, I would be thrilled if my district would make this decision, knowing that I would have the opportunity to give my students the greatest education they deserve. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Mark Harsh. Hello, my name is Mark Karsh, and I'm a resident of Grand Island. Um, I don't have a prepared speech uh, written down like the previous two, but hitting off on what they said, um, daycares are open five days a week. Okay, the governor has already said it's up to the individual school districts to regulate how they're going to do this. We have local school districts around here that are five days a week. You're talking to a father, or you're listening to a father that has five kids in his house. One with an IEP who is getting let down extremely by this board. You have another one that's going through mental health issues. So when we stand and say that we understand what's going on and we feel it, are you seeing kids rip their own hair out because of the frustration of this? As I am. I've had enough. It's going on a full calendar year. It's unacceptable. New York City schools, public schools, are open five days a week. They're opening. It's unacceptable. The mental health that's going on with these kids, it, it, it's disgusting. When I look at these poor kids on the computer, and this is how we have to communicate with them, it's an absolute joke. We are doing nothing but letting them down. I'm not the only one. A lot of people out there are fed up with it. I'm fed up because it's hitting my house. I'm a father, and I'll do everything I have to do for my kids. This is a joke. There's no reason these kids shouldn't be back five days a week. None. I, know, I didn't vote for a hybrid model. This is unacceptable. I, I really don't have much else to say other than I'm, I'm venting right now, and hopefully something gets done about this. I've been patient for almost a full calendar year now. Enough's enough. Nobody's going to pay my co-pays when I have to go sit with my daughter at a mental health counselor Nobody's helping me about that. Nobody's helping my daughter about that. 
Nobody's helping my niece that I have custody of with her IEP. Well, she's struggling. It's unacceptable. I'm asking you guys to do your job, do what it takes, find the requirements that are out there, and get it done. That's all I have. Thank you. Next, we have Jody Luisa. Hi, my name is Jody Luisos, and I have a fourth grader and fifth grader at Gagabine Elementary. Um, I was here last month and I addressed these topics. Returning students back full time five days, uh, why we have to meet all of Dr. Gail Burstein's suggestions uh, versus Cuomo's mandates, and providing live streaming with the hybrid model. Uh, we were told that Dr. Burstein had to let up on the six foot rule before we could open fully. According to the Monroe County Department of Health, they are not capable of calling the shots, keeping schools closed, hybrid, etc. They cannot dictate the school's plans to either distance six feet or the use of barriers. New York State permits six feet or a mask. It does not require six feet and a mask. Barriers are permitted. If there is no money left for the barriers, I'm sure the parents would be willing to help out and buy them if it means getting the kids back in school. When I brought up the live streaming, a possible bandwidth issue was mentioned. And I did find out that there are technology grants, so this is not a valid excuse. Is this a privacy issue? Is this a contract issue? Our kids are not getting the same hybrid plan as other districts are offering, and it's really not fair. Um, the amount of kids signed up for private school is pretty alarming at this point. And it's not because we all came into a pile of money. It's because we're willing to make sacrifices for our kids to give them better education than they're getting right now. Um, we're getting nothing but excuses, blaming. Everybody's failing to take action here, and there's a complete lack of transparency. Dr. Gilberstein has no authority over the school district. The parents I'm here representing have a request. We would like Dr. Graham and the board to ask Governor Cuomo about his reopening school plan, not Dr. Burstein. This was supposed to be discussed at the special superintendent's meeting. Uh, maybe Dr. Graham has some new information for us since the January meeting. Okay, the Northport, the Northport School District, has it's open full-time. Here's their plan. Buildings get disinfected nightly. Uh, there's the high touch areas more frequently. Masks and barriers. Lunch is six feet apart with barriers. Desks are a minimum of 3.5 feet apart. This combined with masks and barriers meets New York State Department of Health requirements. Directional hallways wherever permitted. Parents have continuously offered solutions and it falls on deaf ears. May I suggest a parent and student survey so that you can clearly see how many of us are in favor of live streaming if we can't get to five days. We are almost a year into this. Some schools have been live streaming since March. We deserve to know why you refuse to provide this to our kids. Our school, my school taxes were $6,600, and I paid a tutor over $1,200 already. And what are you going to do to put the needs of the kids first? Um, everyone states that they want the kids back in school in this room, but actions speak louder than words. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Julie um, Degowski. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Dee Degowski. I am a junior and a senior in the high school, and I'm here for the same reason as everybody else. I want my kids in school. Um, I remember back in July when we were all waiting for Cuomo to give an announcement or the first week of August, whether we could go to school or not. And I was actually in the Thousand Islands listening to it uh, uh, online. And when he said, yes, schools could open, we were so excited. And then we found out Grand Island was doing the hybrid plan um, and not plan A, which from what I understand, all of our plans were approved, A, B, and C. So isn't plan A still approved? The plan that we come to school that was approved back in July, it's the same guidelines as hybrid other than with the cohorts. We have barriers, we have tents, we have libraries, cafeterias, hallways, all sorts of extra room to spread kids out. Um, we should have been doing this plan from the beginning. Uh, we know that there's a lot of people in the community that are not comfortable coming to school, they would stay home and they could have been live streaming this whole time. We could have had five days of school this whole time. I, I, we need to work on this for March 1st. 
March 1st, we should be opening the doors and letting our kids come back to school. Um, I'm a problem solver. I want to solve problems. I want to find out what is stopping these things from happening. So you research. Um, I read the whole reopening plan again. I, 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 I get caught up in the language because it's just like somebody else stated. Everything that I read says six feet or barriers or masks when you can't social distance for an extended period of time. We have all these things in place. We've worked so hard to get everybody in the door. What we've done, we can do more. We can do more for these kids. They need to be in school. Um, I don't want to get into all these other things, but there's just so much going on in our divided country right now that for me to sit home and think that my kids aren't in school right now because of anything remotely to do with politics just sends me that not good. That's not good. And I feel like that's where this is coming from now. Um, we have the COVID school report card. All these teenagers that haven't been in school, including my own too, I haven't held them back. They've been doing whatever they want. Not one of them or any of their friends have gotten COVID without masks and social distancing, hanging out at each other's houses. They're safer here in school. And I guess that's, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Jenny Caruana. We can't hear you, so I'm just going to call them when you call them. Jenny Caruana? She's coming. Okay. She's in the other room, and there's a delay. Thanks. Hi, I was skipped. Oh, uh, no. Right at that What's your name? Melissa. Oh, Melissa Graff. Yes. No, let her go. That's okay. fine. Oh, we'll, we'll go back to that next. My name is Jenny Caruana, and I live at 1135 LaSalle. I have six grandchildren in the school district. I applaud everyone that has come out tonight. Um, I'm not going to use up my time, but if somebody else needs to speak, um, I'd gladly give my time to you to continue on if you went on your time. We have plenty of time if you'd like to give your comments. We're not looking yeah, to we're we're listen to everyone. Right, we're going we're just to. just accidentally skip that. Yep. All right, so well, please, I please. have experienced the technical difficulties with my grandchildren. I have six of them, and I'm trying to help my kids so that they can continue to work. And it is so frustrating. It's um, My one daughter has uh, had learning disabilities all through school herself that she should not really be teaching her kids. The other day, we had my granddaughter, who's a second grader. My husband and I had a difficult time trying to figure out this new map that we called her dad at work to try and explain to us a simple addition problem. It is so frustrating, you know? We don't know what the heck. I mean, I know how to, I knew how to add two digits together, but for what they were trying to ask, it was just ridiculous. Um, and I'd also like to know, what is your plan to get these kids back in school? I, I don't see any reason why they're not there now. You can't tell me that these parents, these teachers, aren't going to restaurants, grocery stores. You know, it's like, as other people have said, the safest place is to get them into school. That's all i got to say. Thank you. Mm -hmm. so we will go back to Melissa Graff. Hi, my name is Melissa. Uh, I've got a sixth grader. I have a kindergartner, and I've got another one at home. First of all, I would like to thank all of the teachers because, man, if I had to do that when I was teaching, I don't know if I'd be able to do it. They are kicking butt. 
doing whatever they can to get done what needs to get done. And it's hard, especially for the teachers who don't have the computer knowledge that the younger teachers have. It's hard. So good job to all those teachers out there. Second, um, for me, I'm not necessarily all about returning five days. I want consistency. That's all. If it's five days remote, that's consistency. That's great with me. If it's two days in person, three days remote, live, that's fabulous. I can't do this back and forth stuff. I can't. You know, one week we're all home, the next week we're all at school, then youth gets shut down for a week, we're all back home, and then it's two days here. I can't. It's got to be consistent across the board for everybody. Now I've got a kid that's going to school on Wednesdays half day. So I've got a Monday, a Thursday, and a Wednesday half day. Good luck with daycare. You know, I mean, come on. Parents work for a living. This is ridiculous. Pick one. Stick with it. Second, and I'm reading this for uh, Neil, uh, the Grand Island School Board members were and are elected by the people of Grand Island. Why are we not being allowed to email our elected officials directly without the interference from the superintendent? The canned response we received is, Quote, the Board of Education received your email. They do not individually respond. They operate as a collective group of seven as the board. So none of you have an opinion individually? I mean, you all ran on your own campaign slogans. I'm going to be more accessible. you be able to reach out to me. Uh, so, I mean, from our point of view, Kind of looks like you've been neutered, but uh, other than that, that's about it. Just big thanks to those teachers out there. Okay, next we have Bonnie Nubbin. Just a suggestion, maybe you want to call the second person after her too so they're ready. And then I might go a little faster. Yep. Next will line. be Holly Fratello will be after fun. Hi, my name is Bonnie Evans. I have two kids in the district, one in eighth grade and one in fifth. And like every other parent here, I'm here to let you know that this is not working for my family. My children are suffering. All of our children are suffering. My middle schooler is really struggling. Academically, his grades say he's doing just fine. Mentally, however, is a different story. The combination of isolation and amount of screen time that these kids are asked to endure is not good for anyone, let alone adolescents. I was recently at the pediatrician's office with one of my kids, and I had to laugh, ironically, as right there on the wall is a PSA for the American Academy of Pediatrics saying what the recommended amount of screen time is for kids. It's two hours a day, by the way, considerably less than what we are asking our kids to sit through on a daily basis. My son's mood and overall demeanor has changed. His motivation is dwindling with each passing month. And I've heard the same from many parents of his peers as well. These kids are in desperate need of social interaction, of routine, and consistency. Another thing experts agree is vital to children. Our kids' mental health is suffering. Now on to my daughter. My daughter has a genetic disorder that results in her having developmental dis delays and learning disabilities. Her IEP includes numerous services and accommodations that frankly she just can't receive but the way things are right now, despite the teacher's best efforts. She is significantly behind her peers already, and this just keeps setting her back. My husband and I try our best to help her, but we have no formal training in general education, let alone special education. We have hired tutors to help, which came at the expense of piano lessons, by the way. And while the tutors are helpful, it is no substitute for consistent in-classroom learning with a team of teachers that know my daughter and work together to help her reach her full potential. These are critical, formative years. It's not like it is for you and I. For many of these kids, it's now or never and their now is running out. Why has there not been more of an effort to get kids with IEPs back into the classroom full time? Surely this should be doable, even with the ridiculous six foot guideline. My daughter is the most resilient, hardworking person I know. Her entire life, she has had an incredibly positive attitude despite the difficulties she faces. Within this past year, however, her normally sunny disposition has changed. She's becoming more aware of the gap between her and her peers and feels like the situation is only widening that gap. 
We need to find a way to get all of our students back to school full time, but it is critical to find a way to get our youngest students and our students with IEPs back in the buildings five days a week. Look, every parent can get up here and share their own personal stories about their individual kids and how this is affecting them. The bottom line is we want answers. We want a plan. I'm tired of us all standing here month after month, voicing our concerns and all of you sitting there in silence. I realize that this is not the time or place for a debate, but what do we need to do to actually get some answers? 20 seconds. Lengthy emails from concerned parents are answered with, thank you for your concern. Phone calls are dismissed with, well, we can't do this for whatever reason. It's not good enough. We want a discussion, a dialogue. Where does the problem actually lie? Is it with the state? Is it with the teachers union? How can we get answer? Stop telling us what you can't do, tell us what you can. Stop telling us there's nothing that can be done. It's been being done in other districts as well as in private schools. And even if it wasn't, perhaps we then need to be the trailblazers. I know it's an uphill battle, but I also know our kids are well worth the time and effort it would take. Don't you agree? Thank you. Thank you. Holly Fratello is up now, and uh, Fawn Lindquist will be next. Hi, my name is Holly, and I have an 8th and a 10th grader. Uh, I also work in retail, an industry that employs a large number of high school and college students. Currently, 80% of my staff is 16 and 17 year olds. This is not typical. I'm happy to say I do have a few high school uh, Grand Island students, and they're doing really, really well. I'm here tonight to say it's incredibly hypocritical as parents and leaders of the district and community to tell our kids it is not safe for them to go to school for 30 hours a week with people who test every day that they don't have a temperature of symptoms, but that they can go to work with the public, a group of strangers, legally for 28 hours a week. But they can't go to school safely. But you can work 28 hours a week with people you don't know. Our children and our students are confused and looking to us as adults to guide them on a path of consistent learning and foundation for the future. Thank you, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Fawn Lindquist is next, and following her will be Sherry Steffen. Here we go, all right. So, I know many parents are here in hopes to appeal for you, to you for the schools to open five days a week. While I support them and hope that that can happen, my focus is on the few who are 100% virtual. No matter the reason for choosing to be home, the bottom line is Grand Island schools are failing these kids. I realize there are a lot of complex issues here and I understand the information I've received thus far in emails to Dr. Graham and emails and conversation with the principals and teachers of my kids' schools. I hear there are staffing issues, there are possible union issues, there are potential privacy concerns, there are many other concerns and voices. But truly all I hear are excuses, no solutions. I have the unique perspective of seeing three of our five schools in action as I have six kids in the system. One at Sidway, three at Kegrine, and two at middle school. You can do it. How would you like some water? I oh, it's fine. I'm sorry. While we all, as parents, students, educators, and staff, have been asked to be flexible and understanding, I've been flexible and understanding for over five months this school year, and four months in the previous school year. I've changed part or all of my kids' schedules a minimum of ten times this year, probably more. Hybrid, five days a week, or virtual, the kids need stability. Period. Something the virtual kids don't have at all. They need a set schedule in each school that includes consistent live content and lessons with a designated teacher and other students. If my kids can't see and make friends in person, then they should be given the opportunity to do so virtually. This is the least focused thing in the virtual model and truly one of the most important. 
They need to trust and respect their teachers, make friends their age, talk, laugh, and engage. The model for middle school is generally to take a lesson or create slides with a lesson and wish the kids the best of luck. If they're struggling, they can sign on for a few minutes a day and get help with a couple of questions, and then time is up. Take a bind. There is a virtual instructor who tries hard to help, but it's nearly impossible to do so when the help sessions are twice a day for 30 to 45 minutes each and could have a second, third, and fifth grader on all at once needing help with various items like math, writing, and science. And she is to then flip between each child and each of their assignments within that time. There's not much room to help. There's no live instruction, just recorded lessons by a random teacher not directly involved with Ken Barney then. Sidway has created the bar. They have two live lessons a day with the entire group of virtual students, and my son has been able to create some connections with his new class, and especially his teacher. They laugh together, they share real life stories, and his teacher has even mailed him accolades for doing a good job. Lastly, the specials, art, gym, and music. My kids had an absolute blast when all the schools were virtual and their specials were live. They laughed, they truly exercised, they got excited to join class, and they beamed, showing their art teacher their drawings. Why can't this be the way schools are run for virtual students? There has been at least, has to be at least one teacher that can be available to teach these students. There has to be 30 minutes a week that can be carved out for the art, music, and gym teachers to get on a live lesson with their students. I'm not going to drone on about the stress level in the house, as I know many of us are feeling it. But I think I speak for many parents, parents here when I say, I need to stop being a teacher. I didn't go to school for it. I don't have the tact necessary to engage my kids and excite them to learn. I don't understand Common Core, and I'm teaching myself. I need to go back to being the mom that helps guide them through their questions, or two, not help them with the entire math sheet or the entire essay paper at 5 p.m. because I couldn't stop working my job for a few minutes. I need to stop being a punching bag for their stress and frustration. I need to go back to being there to give them hugs, but they are stressed and frustrated. The virtual students are like the forgotten few. Please, please find a solution and not more excuses. Fun. I think you signed up for another session. I did, because I didn't go with one. <laughs> oh, okay, so you're all set. Thank you. Yes. Okay, we have Sherry Steffens up next, and then Erin Pankhouse following Sherry. Hi, I'm Sherry Steffens. Um, I've seen how hard you work, Dr. Graham, this summer, um, developing the committees to reopen uh, schools, and I'm very thankful for that. Um, but I believe one of the biggest issues that we're going to have in the future and now is mental health. I know academics is important, but I know how much mental health is being affected this year. Parents are struggling, teachers are struggling, staff and students are struggling. I was able to see many different aspects of this pandemic and its effects as I worked in the ER, ICU, antibody infusion clinic, mass testing, mass vaccinating, long-term care units, and of course, school nursing. One common connection between them all was fear. The problem with fear is it leads to many other feelings such as anger, anxiety, insecurity. Um, fear is so great because of the unknown right now. Um, but when parents would come to me, faculty, staff would come to me with questions, and I was able to provide an answer, you could see them calm immediately. Knowledge is truly powerful. So many are confused because of the news and the inconsistency it provides. I believe that we need to create programs that will help answer questions, decrease fears, leading to decreased anxiety and comfort with the return to normalcy for faculty, staff, and students. Mental health is so huge, and I know that our school counselors, social workers, and psychiatrists are drowning, um, and they're going to be drowning even more if we return fully in the future. So we need to open up these programs, create committees that are focused with mental health experts and medical experts so that answers can be provided for parents, for staff, for students as they transition back into school, hopefully fully soon. And I think when we provide those answers and we can give them um, calming and, and truthful solutions, we will have more people that will be willing to come back fully and full time. And it can solve the issues that we have at hand 
with the conflicts that are going on. The divide we are currently experiencing on our community and nationally about how, how and when schools should resume, resume is causing such intense feelings. My girls have been raised in the Grand Island School District for the past 12 years, and I've loved it. My girls have developed many close relationships with teachers, um, hall monitors, bus drivers, and many in between who have helped to teach and develop my kids and make sure that my kids get extra help whenever it's needed. They have helped them grow in so many positive ways. I know we have so many amazing people in the district, and I feel with proper help, education, information, we can move forward together graciously. I believe we've seen this summer how quickly committees can be developed and how efficient and success successfully they can be. And I believe by developing a mental health committee with mental health experts and medical experts so that we can answer questions moving forward and we can make people feel comfortable coming back into school so that we can resume. So I really want to bring my kids back in September. Thank you. Thank you. Next up we have Erin Paintel and following Erin will be Ali Hazar. Okay. All right, so following uh, Aaron will be Eric Peebleborn. Good evening. My name is Aaron Pankow, and my husband and I have four daughters in the district who attend Sidway Youth and BCMS. We're also both COVID-19 survivors twice over, so we definitely aren't insensitive to the pandemic at hand. To say circumstances since March 2020 from a parent perspective is overwhelming is a gross understatement. And I am one of the lucky ones who is mostly a stay-at-home mom working part-time from home. I am home with my kids and we're struggling. My husband and I do have, don't have any family here and no help otherwise, so everything falls on us, and really with his work mainly on me. I'm sure you're aware of stories like ours, nothing out of the ordinary. And I know we've all been asked to pivot and adjust and acclimate, but you know what? Enough is enough. The last Board of Education meeting that I watched virtually as my family and I were quarantined, I was sick to my stomach that you had a middle or high school teachers up there presenting how fantastic everything is going, how the kids are thriving. I have to tell you that my 14-year-old begs to differ, and that was a very unfair snapshot. I can promise you this, we are robbing these kids, and it's enough. Ask Sidley parents and teachers, I promise you they'll tell a different story. And I won't put any of my friends' names in my mouth who work within the district out of respect for them, but they're telling a different story too. There are districts right now in New York State open five days a week. This can be done. Perry, Marion, Orchard Park, K-3, Franklinville, full time starting next week, Frewsburg, several in Long Island, and many, many more. My sister's kids in Florida have been in school since August, five days of in-person instruction. My friend of 25 years who lives in England, which if you're aware, are super tight lockdown over there. Their kids have remained in school throughout this pandemic. They seem to have followed the science, and as we're all aware, kids aren't infecting anyone. There has to be a better way. Don't you agree? I and several friends have had to hire tutors for a couple of our kids. What about the kids and families who aren't afforded this luxury? Still others have sent their kids to private school in pursuit of an actual education. You know what we should be doing? Sending the district an invoice of all these bills because it's expensive, 40 bucks an hour. If our district is so very restricted by our next governor and the restrictions he's put in place, and that's the excuse for hiding behind, though I would argue we're hiding behind much, much more, then bands together, join other districts to rally for our kids, do something. There is power in numbers. We keep hearing people say that all these kids are in the same boat. No, they're not. They're in the same storm, but some are getting a real education. Our kids are not. What we're doing right now is not working. Imagine this for just a moment. This entire building is on fire and it's full of kids. And you're just sitting there and the parents are shaking their fists on the outside and screaming and pleading. And you're, say and you're saying back to us, oh, well, we're just waiting on the fire department to tell us what to do next. If this were an actual real situation, you wouldn't think twice about ushering everyone out and bringing them to safety. Well, I'm here tonight to ring the alarm. The education building is on fire, and we're asking you to rescue these kids. Hey, Eric Bubelhorn and Colleen Huff is the last speaker after Eric. I think she left. She left. Okay. Um, Hi, my name is Colleen Huff. I live on Love Road, and I have a freshman and a junior in the high school. Um, I didn't come here tonight planning to speak, but I walked in the door, and I just feel like I do have to voice some. You know that I've been in, I was involved over the summer. I'm a problem solver, and I, when this first hit and everything kind of already shut down, we understood that things couldn't happen the way that it was ideal or what we thought. Over the summer, I joined in helping with the reopening. 
plan and trying to be a part of it. And even when we opened hybrid, I understood where we were going. But the numbers aren't there anymore. We need to get to this point. And I know you've heard this over and over again. But the private schools have been doing it. If there are parents who still want virtual, give the virtual what they need. Stream live in the school, in the classrooms like a lot of the teachers are doing. In the past, I was told that this was an issue due to privacy or whatever. Obviously, it's not. A lot of the teachers are doing it now, so it must be more individual on the teachers. We need to get to the bottom of this. The teachers, and we work, work for our kids. This is, we pay their salary. These kids that are virtual, and if there's reasons for it, give them what they need to. But let the rest of them come back to school. Do a poll of the parents. See what the numbers are really like. But based on the information, like they've said earlier, it's six feet or a mask or a barrier. You spend all this time putting these things into place. We need to get our kids back in school. I have a child who is not necessarily the most social kid, but it's changing his personality. And when I spoke to him the other day as to why he seems so angry, he said, Mom, I just have to get out of this house. I need to get back. I, I need to be, even in school, we need to give them some time to socialize also. One of the private schools in the area gives the kids five to ten minutes at the end of lunch that they can socialize next to each other if they have a mask on. Short in time. But these kids need time. They need to be kids. They need to have the socialization too. So just having a barrier up and all of that, some of that's going to need to change too. And I understand the fear. I work for a dental practice. I had to open a dental practice and tell my hygienists and my doctors to run a high speed that sprayed aerosol into the air. You want to talk about fear? You want to talk about people not knowing how to handle something. If you want solutions on how to infection control train these people in the school, I'll come in and do it. We have been open since June. We have not had one case of COVID. Nationally, dental offices have not had more than 1% that they've been able to trace back to even possibly from a dental practice. If you wash your hands, you keep the sanitation, kids have the mask on other than when they're eating, you can do this. And I get that there's fear. There's fear from the adults. I get that. But we have to get past this. It's doable. The, sci the numbers are coming down. The science is there. You purchased all the things to keep the school clean. It's time to bring these kids back. I know you keep hearing this over and over again, but we are doing more damage to their mental health than anything could happen to any physical health of these kids at this point. 20 seconds. Um, that's, the other thing is I'd like to see... We, if the sports is open, can we get some of the other things back into place? Tech club, D&D club, the after school clubs for these kids. They need time together. Sports can be open, the other things should be allowed too. Thank you. That concludes our voice of the people. And we will move on. Ashley, yep. I do have a little presentation that comes later in the agenda. It's the COVID-19 report, I could show it now or wait till later. It may, may help answer a few questions. So, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So again, I want to thank those individuals who have come out tonight to share and express your concerns and opinions. I do, there were some questions that were asked tonight that may be answered in this uh, mini presentation. It's not too long, but it's here for you. Uh, each time that we have a board meeting, we do talk a little bit about COVID-19. As some of the members of our community shared with us tonight, there, there is a decrease or a decline in the percent positive in Erie County. This chart represents 4.1% uh, over the past seven days. Uh, the next chart, I'm sorry, this chart is Erie County and this chart is Western New York. So again, over the last seven day rolling average, it was 4.3%. Uh, and this data is attributed uh, since uh, February 7th. Uh, many of you may have seen this uh, chart uh, that we have looked at or this uh, website. Uh, this is all of Erie County since March. As you can see, uh, there's 1,371 individuals since last March who've been identified on Grand Island as being positive, 58,000 cases in Erie County and 1,500 deaths attributed to COVID-19. This chart represents the week-to-week -week increase 
of COVID-19 since September 4th. It uses this data every week. As you can see, on September 4th, we started the school year with 152 individuals on the entire island being positive for COVID-19. And then on September 11th, it went up by four, and then the 18th by three. So you can see that we've been keeping track each week. Uh, you can also notice that as of October 30th, it increased by almost 6%, and then on November 6th, it increased by 12%, 14%, the next week, 23%, uh, and so on and so forth. So you can see that uh, when we ended up pivoting and the county was identified as orange on November 23rd, uh, we had 20% change from week to week of positive persons on Grand Island. And it continued on as high as 29% on December 11th. December 18th, it started to drop. The 23rd dropped more. January 4th dropped more. And then on the 11th, it kind of spiked. And then it's been on the decline. And as of February 5th, it's 4.3%. This is what it looks like uh, charted since September to now. So clearly, uh, between November and December and the holidays, uh, many, many more individuals on the island have tested positive, and now it's on a decline, which is great news. So the bit of history, uh, some of the questions asked tonight refer to why are we in hybrid? And some people cited a memo from the Department of Health and the New York State Education Department that was given to superintendents on July 13th and July 16th. We received two documents from the State Education Department that referenced the following. Schools must ensure that students and staff are protected by requiring at least one of the following, social distancing of six feet or barriers or face mask coverings. This was a memo that was given to superintendents across the district or across the state. And it was at that time that we were very excited because we were planning and fully reopening in September based on this information. And then on July 22nd, we received a, a clarifying frequently asked question document. Pursuant to the Department of Health guidance, schools must ensure that appropriate social distancing, six feet barriers is maintained between individuals while on school facilities and on school grounds, inclusive of students, faculty, and staff, unless safety or the core activity requires a shorter distance. And then again, re referenced again, schools must maintain protocols and procedures for students, faculty, and staff to ensure appropriate social distancing to protect against the transmission of COVID. Obviously, this memo says six feet or barriers or a face mask. This memo from the New York State Department of Education requires superintendents to follow and ensure these social distancing practices. Is that memo public? I, I have it. Well, so. I appreciate that, but is the yeah. public going to be provided to the public generally? I guess I'm sure. Okay. Because I think there's a misconception or, you know, about that. Um, that yeah, we heard that tonight. talking about, and I have done my own research to try to figure out where that comes from, and I have not been able to easily find this particular document, so if, 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 if it can be made. Sure, we'll put it right on our website. Public, I think that would be helpful that this is what we're following based upon state aid, which was, excuse me, um, New York State Education Department guidelines. Yep. Okay, because if the issue that, you know, as you said, we were very happy when we heard it was one or the other because we thought we could open completely, okay? It seems to me that what you're suggesting based upon this is that this might be, this particular guidance might be the biggest barrier we have to going completely open. I would agree wholeheartedly. So if that's the case, then A, let's, I, I like to see it myself in the memo, because I don't think I, I, I may have been provided back in July, but I'm, I'm not sure I have. But I think we need to make that more public, at least locally and also I'm going to make sure myself that more people know about it yep. because I think it's the issue that you know if we're going to try to do something about it then let's go to state ed um, and say we need to change this because we need to do something different yep. and we're hearing from many people 
as I've been arguing since the beginning, we should be open 100%. And if this is the barrier, we've got to fix it. It is absolutely the barrier. Okay. And every board of education and school superintendent take an oath to follow the New York State I Education Department. And you're saying the same I, thing. I, I, I agree with that. So it's that is why we have opened in the hybrid. Right. Yeah. Yeah, if, I, we I, could, I, if we could, following just what Lynn says, we could get a seat at the table and possibly attend a regent's board meeting, a New York State ed meeting, and, and just request to be on their agenda. You never know if they. Well, we put us on the agenda, but um, if we could request that to, I mean, I don't know if your superintendent group ever does anything like that. That would be wonderful to speak directly to people that have a seat at the table to make the decisions regarding these kinds of memos. Well, there is a board of agents that exists. Yes. That, yes. Um, I don't know who our area representative is these yeah. days. I, I, should I still be Catherine Collins. Yeah, I, yeah. I think that we yeah. should certainly try to make you know, uh, some headway in that area. Yeah, I, I appreciate those comments and I agree with them. Thank you. So I, if you don't mind, I'll just continue and then we can get on with the rest of the agenda. Uh, so as I just mentioned, and just to reiterate, I apologize for the redundancy, but we do not have the authority to ignore the six feet social distancing requirements from the New York State Education Department. This board, would would have to bring me up on charges if we did not follow the New York State Education Department. So it's very important that people understand that. Uh, and again, you know, we talked for many months about the challenges that we have in this district to take all of our kids from K to five and split them up so that we're social distancing and following six feet of social distancing. Not only would we have to hire many, many additional teachers, there are 20 classroom teachers at Sidway. If you try to split up the class, a class of 20 or a class of 21, into two classes, that's doubling the enrollment, right? That's or doubling the amount of teachers. So on the surface, you're talking about $4 million to do that. And then we don't have classrooms to put them in. Some people tonight mentioned Niagara, Weefield, and Sweet Home, and we have talked as a board about those districts. Sweet Home and Niagara, Weefield are very unique. They are offering five days, but they had, I think one district had 17 extra instructional coaches that they reassigned. We have zero instructional coaches. They had 17. So I'm just, I'm just trying to illustrate that yes, some districts had a wealth of personnel that they could reassign and empty classrooms. We do not have that luxury. If you walk through our classrooms or walk through our schools, we, do, we really do not have empty classrooms. So I just want to make sure that people understand that we have talked about these ideas and many of them are not uh, financially prudent or economically sound. I just think that's really important. Somebody else today talked about the confusion of watching national or local news when you hear that the director of the CDC is saying that schools should reopen. Uh, the, the national director of the CDC is saying that, but she is not saying that about schools that are in hybrid. She is referring to schools that have never reopened at all meaning the Chicago Public Schools. Some, you know, Buffalo Public just started bringing some, some children back, right? Those schools, those public schools in urban settings are struggling to reopen. We did not struggle. And many of the districts all around uh, Erie County opened in hybrid right away in September. So when you hear national news and local news stories talking about the CDC and its plan, or a suggestion to reopen schools, please understand that they're not talking about schools in hybrid. If you were to go to the CDC website, which is updated as of February 3rd, and you scroll down till you, till you see, and it's right away on that webpage, you scroll down to see the continuum of risk that the CDC is talking about. They first talk about the lowest risk, which is everybody remote. Then they talk about 
hybrid as some risk. And this statement says, hybrid learning model where most students and teachers participate in virtual learning and some students and teachers engage in person learning is some risk for the transmission of COVID. The CDC additionally says a medium level of risk is for hybrid learning where most students and teachers engage in in-person learning and some students and teachers participate in virtual learning, which is really like our district. Higher risk, according to the CDC, is students and teachers engaged entirely in in-person learning activities and events. And they also uh, reference that again as the highest risk for the transmission of COVID. Our district is really in between some risk and medium risk in our current hybrid model. So finally, as we wind this little presentation down, it's also important for our community to understand the numbers since November up to today of, of individuals in our district who have had positive cases of COVID-19. Sidway, we have had nine since November, 17 at youth, 10 at Kegabine, 16 at the middle school, and 38 at the high school. Also, looking at these numbers, from the beginning of January to today, we have had 27 employees who have needed to be isolated and 22 additional employees who have needed to be quarantined. So when the district has pivoted youth to be 100% virtual for a week, it was because we were having staffing issues. And so these numbers just illustrate uh, some of the concern that we've had in January with uh, COVID. So it's gonna to continue to be our recommendation to employ the hybrid model until we receive notice from the New York State Education Department that we can reduce the physical distancing requirement of six feet. Today, I had a meeting with the Erie and Niagara School Superintendents Association, and we are going to put a letter out there asking for a seat at the table, as Ashley said, to be part of a plan and a process to, to bring more students back to school across the state and to reduce the six feet of social distancing, which is currently the requirement. As some of you know, I'm the Vice President of the Erie Niagara School Superintendents Association, so our little board met today at 3.30, and we are committed to putting together that letter to ask for a seat at the table at the state level. So we really do hope that that is something that comes to fruition. Brian. I just have one kind of question for clarification. So when they talk about Dr. and Dr. Cuomo, um, I think it was the suggestion for, first being suggestion versus formal commandment. Really, what seems to be that for as a school Yes, for me, I take an oath to file the New York State Education Department. And by my certification and my appointment here, and yours as a governing body, we do file the New York State Education Department. They have worked collaboratively with the New York State Department of Health, but that memo that Glenn would like to see on our website came from the New York State Education Department. So that supersedes anything else that. And I'm only just asking to clarify that because that, I think that's where the most confusion comes in is where people are hearing Cuomo, they're hearing this. You know, it's, it, I think it's important to understand where the six feet comes from. That's all. And I just wanted to know, like, the hierarchy. Well, I, I knew the hierarchy. That, I guess the question. That is absolutely so that right. And, and the governor has influence on how, yeah. how the New York State Education Department views this pandemic. I, I mean, I. Would, would go further and say if the governor made a decision at this point in time, he makes lots of decisions that based upon the executive order that he was, based upon the executive order, he could probably do it himself. Um, or at least he could do it himself. Um, I've talked about this before about the frustration over since um, we started, um, since schools closed in March, and then when we went to a hybrid model of has anyone state education department or anybody else ever suggested what needs to happen to be open is there a plan to be open completely has anybody said and i know the answer is nothing um but nobody has said if we get to this point in time we can reopen okay as someone here said my sister's a teacher in florida 
They've been open since March, since since, April, since August. Okay, other states have been open since since August. I think you know most people will say kids are better off in school. Okay, I understand certain folks might think it's better to not have their kid in school, and I understand that because of their personal issues. However, okay, we should be moving towards that. We should be getting someone, okay, in the education department or in state government should be providing some guidance of what needs to happen in order to get to that point. Okay. Now, is it, has there been discussion? Is it based on the number, a positive percentage? Is it based uh, on? I don't, I don't, I don't think any. I don't, I don't think any school, school district. At all. I don't think any school district understands what the state. What? Education department has in mind for a timeline or a process. Right. So, so I will, as part of the Erie Niagara School Superintendents, we will be composing a letter asking for a seat at the table for, for to be part to be part of the, the, the process, be part of the plan to help develop the plan. I mean, that'll be one of our requests. And then we'll have our input as what we believe would be. If they allow us to, yes, yes, agree. Well, I, I, I think that it should be perhaps more than input. I mean, at this point in time, I think that. You know, um, so much evidence suggests that we should be on some open, um, and I think that in my mind we should be pushing for that. At least I'm pushing for that. Okay, and I, as, I, as I have been, and I certainly can't suggest that that's the position that each school district in Western New York should take. Okay, or each board should take, or each individual board member should take. Okay, but I certainly think that you know we should we should ask the question of what. You know, what will it take to uh, to, to to get to that point? Right? Yeah, I agree. And and and, 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 and I agree. continue that dialogue. I think we need to push to see what kind of a plan. You know, the New York State Education Department has in mind for us. I think there should definitely be some kind of guidance and some kind of plan. I know Dr. Remy said, um, "Would it be prudent? Would it be sound to?" You know, hire 17 teachers, and to I don't even know if prudent and sound is the, is the right word. Would it be possible? I mean, I don't even think it would be feasible or possible with our budget because we did not have uh, the padding that Sweet Home had of 17 teachers on special assignment. We cut that uh, last year. We brought those teachers back um, and cut the teachers on special assignment that we had that were working professional development. So I don't, you know, when I did uh, talk to Scott Johnson at Sweet Home. They had, um, like you said, the, the 17 teachers. But I don't, I don't know that it would be financially possible for our district to replicate something well, like just that. Just 17 or 20 times eighty thousand dollars, and then we would be laying those people out. That would be just at one school. That would be just at one school. That would be just one school. And that's, and that's, and that's understanding that not space to do it. So yep. I mean, right. it's 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 it's, 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 it's yeah I think I think it really yeah. is. I think that you know it goes back to you know, six feet and and mass right. issues that are really the I think the biggest frustration, especially for us that uh, I don't want to speak for everybody for myself as a board member, is we sit here at the tables and give the best education and then we take mandates from New York State, you know, education department, and it's, 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 it's a fight, I guess, that it can't, I don't, I don't want to say can't be fought because we can definitely put the pressure, but they are a governing, governing body, and as you said, that, you know, we take an oath, right? So um, it's very frustrating, and it, but I will say it is also surprising that educators at state level are not working for this plan. And I do want to say that there may be some good news for New York State Education Department because they just approved a new commissioner, uh, and that announcement came out of the Board of Regents today. And she has a wonderful experience, and she has served on the Board of Regents. So there is, you know, the beginning of some hope, you know, that we will have leadership there that will listen and want to work with us. I love to say I think that if yes, when is the biggest question. We're just stuck until until we, we have, have that plan. Some kind of plan. If the state stays below this for this long, then we can reduce something and bring more kids back. I think that's the parents' biggest frustration is if this just seems like it's indefinite forever and there's no end to it. Correct. I know what he wants a no end. Kind of target, it would be a conversation and understanding, right? Um, and, and I think that's not just 
for our district here, I think that is for you know all the districts and all the parents across you know the state. It's just it's frustrating because we can't even get out what this happens or we're looking at this day if this has to happen. I mean, it's just it just seems kind of ridiculous for lack of a better word that they're not even pushing for as some would say the greatest education we can ever with with with, with with an understanding that the evidence has certainly shown that schools sure. are not the spreaders of, of uh, the, the main, you know, super spreaders, um, as people were saying back in, you know, uh, September or before that. So. I mean, the CDC is saying that, and the New York State saying that, and Dr. Bernstein has said it, right? Like, so that that's where the frustration is, that, it, that unfortunately is being held up, I guess, at the education level. And everything else is opening up, and people are doing Correct. That. Absolutely. All right, one more question, slightly off that topic, but someone mentioned about uh, with the sports starting back up and the clubs. Do we have what, what types of opportunities do these kids have now? Or sure. sure. Every so club advisor, virtual, sorry, Jay? Even if it's a virtual club or. Yeah. Every club advisor can meet with their principal to talk about returning to in person after school activities. So, for example, Jennifer Mernitz today approached myself and Mr. Loria to discuss. Uh, rehearsals after school here you know, in person. So it's starting to happen. We're starting to see, you know, our teachers and our advisors have interest in meeting in person. Yeah, I certainly think with the mental health side of it, and that would be a huge game changer for a lot of these kids to be able to interact and, and you know, become active again in their school communities. So, I agree. Or more so. Yeah. It's, it's surprising to me that all sports or many sports are not allowed, but other activities you know, music. music, arts, clubs, you know, are still stagnant. Um, and certainly I can't believe that, you know, um, much it's, it's, it's great to hear that basketball is happening again, that there's not some other activities that the music kids can get and the kids who are in other activities can't have those same opportunities. Because um, they set out just the way, you know, you get the, the, the sports kids work. And they can, they can have those opportunities and like I just mentioned, Jennifer Moran's met with us today to begin in-person after-school uh, rehearsals. And, and that's great. So thank you for letting me jump that ahead. And hopefully the people who are watching online or are here today, uh, that, that was a helpful uh, bit of information. So thank you, Ashley. Okay, so uh, we are going to Moving on to the, uh, there's nothing under curriculum instruction, so personnel. Sure. I just I would like to just add that the Board of Regents this week will be addressing the uh, Regents exams. So we're waiting to hear if Regents exam if they will apply for the waiver to uh, not have the Regents exam. So we should hear some news this week from there. Okay, thank, thank you. you. All right, so we had finished up with our public comment session and agenda items only. So we're moving on to curriculum and instruction. We don't have anything in that section. So personnel instructional. If I could have a motion to approve PI1 and PI2, please. I'll make sure. And a second. I'll All second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any abstentions? Motion carried 6-0. Um, and moving on to personnel non-instructional, if I could have a motion to approve PNI one and PNI two with the removal of PNI one C. I'll motion. And a second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any objections? Any abstentions? Motion carried six zero. And now we are on to our finance section. Um, Dr. Harris, did you want to start with our uh, presentation for that first? Sure, uh, Ruby. Um, Ashley's asking if we can do our budget presentation now. Yes. Okay. Do you want to move it, okay. want to, move it to the end of the meeting or do you want to run through? It's up to the board. Um, so, um, it won't change the amount of time that it takes. <laughs> <laughs> I think 
looks like a band aid. Let's go. <laughs> Okay, guys, I just kind of run through the agenda with the budget at the end. We're going to approve everything in the meetings, right? And then we'll go done, we're done. All right, so um, let's go through finance A through D. Um, and then we'll keep going with the budget. So, like, is everyone okay with doing the budget at the end? Any objections to that? Okay. All right, I will make these items pretty quick. Um, the first Two items are for obsolete equipment. One is in food service and one is in the high school, but it is both in the area of ovens. Um, the one that is declared by food service uh, will be replaced and it's non-working. Um, so those are two obsolete items. Um, the next one is budget transfers over 15,000. It is in the area of capital project and it's just making sure the funds is the correct account code um, to be paid out. The next item is source well procurement. We actually have used source well in the past. I'm just kind of going through uh, with buildings and grounds and transportation on anything that is cooperative, making sure that I have board approval on paper um, in case any questions come up in the future that we follow the proper protocol, but that is for cooperative purchasing. Um, and that is it for the action items. If I can have a motion to approve A through D, please. And a second. All second. All in favor? Aye. All right. Any objections? Any extensions? Motion carried seven zero. Okay. Then I have um, the quarterly report for extracurricular um, that's given for the uh, Board of Education to review. And if you have questions, please feel free to ask. Um, you have the December check warrants uh, here for your review. You also have the appropriation status report um, for July through December. I did mention at our last I believe it was the last official um, board meeting how uh, the dates overlap. So we did correct that just so you could see what's happening um, in all fund areas from that time period. You also have the November and December um, treasurer's report for your review. And you have the November, and I want to say... December um, revenue status report for your review. And then um, there was a request just to get an update on the um, Chromebooks and iPad rollout. So um, per uh, Robin uh, Quitek, who has done a phenomenal job with her entire IT department um, in getting this done, all students K through 12 have a district device assigned to them that they take home. Um, and kindergartners currently have iPads and grades one through 12 have Chromebooks. Um, and as always, I literally just signed a piece of paper telling a parent they owe $169 for something with a Chromebook. So as always, purchase the Chromebook accident damage insurance. Um, it's a $10 yearly premium. As you see here, it does say that damages can be as high as 300. Uh, and the deductible when there is an incident is only 20 bucks. So that's just a plug there. Um, and then there is budget transfers under 15,000, um, which was just some movements for supplies, um, some iPad things for kindergarten and um, uh, a architect coverage uh, for an invoice. And then I'm ready for the presentation. Hey, Dr. Harris, can you tell parents where to go to purchase that $10 um, or $20 um, it's $10. The actual insurance itself is $10. The the $20 is when you actually have an incident occur um, with the device. And I believe, Dr. Graham, you can remember where the purchase is because I cannot remember the platform name. Uh, for most families who are familiar with my school bus, there is a drop down. Then you know a drop-down item in the menu of things that can be purchased, whether it's uh, food for our kids or the Chromebook insurance. It's all there. Um, so I was able to do it for my family, and it worked out very nicely. So the ten dollars uh, purchase to protect the Chromebooks is on my school box, where you do the lunch time. Correct. And Ruby, maybe at the next board meeting, we can uh, put that up on the screen and capture that video. 
the process of going to my school box and choosing the Chromebook insurance. Sure. So at the next board. I'll make a note. We will come back to the budget presentation and move on to special education and people personnel services. Please show up for them. Okay. I will be quick as well um, so that Ruby can get started on our budget presentation. Um, two quick items, CSC and CPSC program recommendations. Um, if I could have a, a motion on those, please. Thank you. And a second. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any objections? Any abstentions? Motion carried 7-0. Thank, Thank you very much. All right. And under policy, we have an update from Dr. Harris on the BOCES policy services. Yes, this is a lot of talking tonight. Um, so under uh, policy services, I did reach out to Erie One BOCES um, actually a couple of days before uh, Dr. Graham had uh, asked for a board update. Um, the last email I received from Erie One, which was I believe on the 4th, was just expressing that they were hitting the tail end of their review and that they would be sending out the first draft to the district um, shortly. I will send out another um, feeler email just to see where they are this week. Uh, just as a reminder, it is even when um, we go through both season, we have that discussion um, with uh, different service agreements and things we're signing up for. The policy review is a two-year process. Um, with them. That's how you sign up for it. Um, we do, in the meantime, get updates as they are provided uh, to the school district to be reviewed. I, I don't believe we've had anything um, thus far. Um, but as soon as that becomes available, I will not only send it out to the um, policy committee, but I will also let the board know that we at least have the first draft um, and that we're working through it. So you can kind of feel out the timeline of how things are going. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. And now we're moving on to our Board of Education report because we have finished the superintendent's report. Okay. Yep, okay, so now we'll go on to the Board of Education report. Uh, first up, the Erie County Association of School Boards legislative meeting um, happened uh, a couple weeks ago, and I sent Grim Donald up to meet with our representatives virtually. So anyone that wants to join that meeting, it will be a virtual meeting with our legislative representatives and Dave Lowry setting that up for um, Grand Island. So it'll be one more opportunity to ask for a plan from our representatives to reopen schools and um, advocate for that. So we will have a seat at the table in terms of meeting with our legislative reps and I will keep the board posted on when that, when that virtual meeting happens. If you'd like to join in. Okay, District Parent Council Liaison Report, Sue. You know, I don't really have anything to add except that the PTA is, you know, working hard to try and maintain all of the um, the programs and activities that they support and add to um, our uh, kids' academic experience. You know, they're running into their own difficulties. Um, but they are trying their best. They are working towards um, some fundraising ideas. And I know we talked about the celebration of inspiration, which, you know, we just kind of have to wait and see if that's going to be virtual or in person again. They talked about some of the um, awards that will be given out in, in the high school, and I think they're going to try and move that so we give them out in the current year instead of the next fall. And they are still planning on giving out their um, scholarships. And I know that with, you know, the difficulties of getting parents enrolled and, and involved with our hybrid model, that they are in need of readers for the um, scholarship program. So if you're a member of the PTA um, at any of your children's schools, if you would like to be a part of reading for their scholarships, they would much appreciate it. And just a little plug for that. I did that last year for the first time. It's fantastic. It's super easy and yeah. super fun to read all the kids' essays. So everything's redacted, so you don't know whose essay is whose. Um, but yeah, I encourage people to, to volunteer for that if you're interested. Thanks, Jerry. Okay, thank you. Moving on to the hybrid virtual model discussion with the board. Um, does anyone want to start? 
I mean, I know um, after listening to um, all the parents and the feedback, I'm interested to know whether um, New York City is opening up five days hybrid, or is that, you know, what are, what are they doing? What are other, I think there was a, a point on other hybrid models, other virtual models, um, what's happening in other districts. I know we know what Sweet Home's doing. Is Niagara Wheatfield, um, do you know, happen to know what exactly Niagara Wheatfield is doing? Yep, I do. Uh, yep, I spoke with Mr. Lalanich uh, early on in this process. Uh, they have a lot of students choose 100% virtual, and they also reassigned many, many AIS teachers to be classroom teachers to either accommodate the 100% virtual or uh, in person. So they had a wealth of uh, personnel available to them and available classrooms, and many, many, many students choosing 100% virtual. You know, I just want to add, I know Lancaster um, has come up over the weekend in many comments of the school district has opened, and I believe, Brian, you know that they are in hybrid as well. Yes, well, Lancaster is in hybrid, but on Wednesdays, uh, children come to school in person uh, by cohort. So uh, maybe, you know, one week, you know, cohort L is in session, and then the next week, it's the embassy. So they're not there five days with full classrooms. They just opened that additional day every other week. That's my understanding. And, and just one other school that was mentioned, and I'm, I'm not putting you on the spot, it's just kind of a question. That was brought up that North Point um, is open with only a three point. Yeah, I don't even yeah. know where that school district is. Me neither. Okay. I was just wondering if we, you know, again, I wasn't putting yeah. you on the spot. I, no, I, I have no idea. There. Where that is located, I don't have any details. I couldn't tell anybody unless somebody here at the board knows that North Point is in a certain part of our state. I have no idea. No, um, yeah, I just was curious because I was I was surprised to hear that. It's not really okay. um, Very quickly back to Wheatfield. So are you sorry. saying that they are? Sorry, are they saying that they're? Um, they had so many students going virtual. They're still able to maintain six feet of. Distance. That's what I'm saying, and that they okay. had a lot of extra teachers to either accommodate those who are virtual and those who are in person. So they're they're not hybrid. They're, they're not. I'm, all I'm saying is that I think kids are coming to school on a regular basis because they have the room and they're able to maintain six feet of social distancing based on a high number of kids who are staying home. Okay. So that high virtual allows them to be like in terms of numbers, a hybrid model with the six feet of social distance. And we started the school year with 13% of our students who were home. Okay, so we did not have enough to be able to maintain six feet of social distance and um, do what's happening there. Gotcha. And then live streaming. I don't know um, if anyone has any comments or um, questions about live streaming, but um, I'm wondering if we could possibly, especially with, you know, parents, um, struggling to teach their children at home. That comes up quite a bit in conversations. Is there any way for middle school and high school to investigate um, some live streaming? Because it's, I know it's very challenging. I wouldn't be able to do some, I am a teacher, but I would not be able to do some of the middle school, um, teach some of the middle school content in say the math, the science. So. I know the struggle that parents have in terms of helping their children at home, and I don't know if there's any way we can look into that more, if anyone has any other comments about live streaming. I know that some teachers are doing it, some teachers aren't doing it. It's kind of left up individually to the teacher, and I know that it may work for some classes and not others. It might be very difficult to have 12 kindergartners in front of you, and then 12 kindergartners on um, a live stream for a teacher that, you know, She's working um, to do hands-on activities and uh, cutting and pasting and things like that. It might be it might be a challenge. So the live streaming may not work for every class in every class um, grade level. But I'm wondering if we could look into that more possibly as something in our toolbox. I don't know if everyone else in the board feels about that, or if anyone wants to add to the conversation. Yeah, no, I just want to. It's fantastic that they are doing some live streaming, but I, I know there are some incidents where parents have more than one kid in the district, 
one child receiving live streaming, the other one isn't. So there's there's a lot of frustration there. While it's awesome that some of the teachers are live streaming, I, you know, I, I I would like to try and maybe look at doing it more, even if it was like for more of our core subjects like English, math. I'll tell you, math is one of the hardest ones to do mm -hmm. as a parent at home. Um, I'm very I'm very lucky. I have a brother who I just that helps tutor me so I can teach my son, but maybe if we can just look more into it and maybe, you know, try the waters um, to see if we could do some more of that. I think, um, I think, that, and I, I, that's what I hear our community asking for as well. Yeah. So, yeah. If I could just ask, this, the teachers that are live streaming, um, have we provided PD for them? Have they kind of just worked that out on their own? Um, can we look into providing? Development in the future for some, you know, to encourage some more of it. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> yeah. And maybe who knows how to yeah. do it exactly. And maybe we can hire some West Seneca teachers yeah. to do it, right? right, yeah. right. Because you know, I think I think what made teachers comfortable to begin trying it was the fact that they were we were shut down from November twenty third to December twenty third, and upon returning, some teachers felt comfortable because they were already engaged in live casting every day, right throughout that month. So I think that that some of our more savvy teachers, you know, with that technology, are trying it. I know, you know, we, we've heard it here as a board that the entire math department here at the high school is doing it, and it's starting to grow organically. Uh, to you know, I think Ashley just talked about the challenges of a primary school teacher and uh, the great work that they do in managing classroom, uh, the, the space in the classroom, and the children in front of them. To ask them to manage, you know, ten kids that are in front of them and ten kids who are home could, is is an exceptional challenge for the elementary age, the young elementary students. But overall, I'm very pleased that people are trying it. We're, I'm seeing it every day. I went on an observation last week, and I saw a teacher, a special education teacher, working with two children at a kidney-shaped table in the classroom while the co-teacher was teaching the rest of the children. And the special education teacher was live casting to children who are hybrid and home all at the same time all at the same time all within the classroom and it was remarkable it was remarkable what the teachers are doing so teachers i can tell you that the teachers association is has encouraged live casting our principals are encouraging it i'm encouraging it and it's worthy of further conversation and we will continue to have that conversation i just think it's important that if we are going to encourage it we give them the support that right. they need sure. to do it properly yeah. And, yeah. And, and approach it with a plan, um, a workable plan. Definitely. I think everyone's coming in at a different point. There are some teachers who are familiar with it and are tech savvy and can do it and, and maybe teach colleagues, but there's some teachers that may need a, a bit of professional development to get that up and running and feel comfortable doing it. I know it's a challenge. I do. A lot of synchronous instruction in my class. Actually, every lesson I do all day is, is synchronous. And it is a challenge for classroom management. It really is for balancing the students in front of you with the students at home. And it's it's definitely it's challenging management wise, but it's also um, you know, can be technologically challenging to you have to really think about the Google Classroom and what you're putting in Google Classroom for the students at home to be able to have the same materials and it's just it definitely is a lot. <laughs> I will say that. It's it's a challenge. Both from the classroom management end to you know, the technology end of things. So if we could provide professional development, I agree with Jay wholeheartedly, you know, that's something that we can look at possibly for the next or you know, ongoing staff development as a topic too. Can we approach teachers who are doing it well? And ask them to offer professional development to the, the teachers who are struggling. Oh, absolutely. All right, and I can I commiserate with you, um, Ashley. I teach art remotely, <laughs> and um, I do understand the um, materials issue. <laughs> and I watched actually our art teacher here at the middle school. I have to send out some kudos. I watched my daughter. On days that I've been home remote with uh, drawing the toilet paper kind of um, piece and her instructing and it's just 
And really, it's masterful. Like, I, I'm just amazed at how she's able to see the students' work and give comments. And it's, I mean, teachers, I, I just want to echo what the parents said that were here tonight. They are doing a remarkable job. We understand how difficult a job it is. We really do. And um, geez, not to put more on you, but if we could do professional development for live streaming, um, it sounds like that's what the community uh, really is asking for. And um, that would be that would be great moving forward. One that would have the consistency that we need. Another thing that is a concern for me um, with the hybrid model is kids with IEPs. And I know that legally we are mandated to make sure that we're meeting all of the all of the things that they have on their IQ, whether it's speech services, counseling, um, any sort of um, items like that. And I'm just wondering if there is a way that um, we can have look at the numbers in the classrooms or see if there's a way that those students with IPs, I know that our, our most severe students. Um, more students that um, have multiple disabilities that are self-contained classroom. I believe they are. They are full-time for or five days. Because it's a small classroom. It's like a 1211 or 611 or 811 that we have. So those are full-time. What about the students that are have consultant teacher services or other those kinds of services? I'm not sure how many we're talking and what the numbers are in each classroom. I don't know if there's a way we can look at that data. And see if we can do something with that. I mean, maybe at the next meeting, Cheryl, you know, Cardone can put together a presentation on, on those services in the district. Is that okay, Cheryl? Yes. Okay, thank you. Did anyone else have any comments on the hybrid virtual models? I just agree with what everyone was saying about doing the live streaming and kind of making it universal so that all of the kids are getting the same across the line. All sixth grade is getting the same math lesson, all seventh grade is getting the same type of lesson and materials at the same time. It's really important so that some groups of kids aren't falling behind the other groups. And I agree that if the teachers need professional development to be able to do that, then we need to look at what we can do so that they're all equitable throughout what we're doing. And I know Japan did offer, they have started offering their kids, some of them with the IEPs, they are coming in full time, while other kids still come in behind right where they're starting. They have done that. I guess my question would be, going back to the students with IEPs, is would there be room to maintain six feet of social distance? So, so, um, Cheryl, in, in the presentation, what I would be looking for is, you know, we have um, these, this number of students in self-contained. If you take the students that are in self-contained that, that are going to school uh, four days already or five days already, the students that we have left, how many students is that? And if you break it down by grade level, how many students in each grade level would that be? And how many classrooms do we have? in that grade level. So in other words, how many students would be, we be adding per room is what I would want to know because I think it's, you know, it definitely is something we need to um, be cognizant of that we are um, complying with those mandates on the IP. I'm a special education teacher, so I know, I know how important that is. So Ashley, I can answer, are all of our self-contained classes K to 12 um, are coming four days a week. They uh, Most of them did start the school year four days a week. Um, and then we did infuse the middle school and Sidway and Kegabine, um, you know, the 811 classes um, to four days a week. We started those very early on. And Felicia and John, I'm not sure if it was October or November, but um, we, we did get those um, classes four days a week. And then the other thing I want to note too is if we do have a consultant, um, teacher child um, that we uh, do believe that um, has a lot of needs we on an individual case-by-case -case scenario so that we maintain that social distance um, in the classrooms we I have talked to each and every principal in every single building you know has a few of those students that are going 
four days a week because of student need. The most recent um, prior, the children, two students um, were at the high school that um, they really felt, you know, could use those four days. So those things are happening on a case by case um, basis. Also, you know, a little bit at a time, you know, when we look back at their need, their grades, you know, what kind of support they need, what's going on at home. So that is constantly happening at every single one of our buildings. Thank you. I don't know if anyone have any other questions <clears throat> regarding those items. So we, um, if there's nothing more on the hybrid virtual models, then we'll move ahead to uh, the Board of Education draft resolution. So I um, had emailed the board the draft resolution that's in your packet that I put together just to give us a starting point here to work from. Okay. Well, hold on. Uh, Jeff Swaitzik does have it. Um, he hasn't gotten back with us yet. Yeah, I, I, uh, I'm not sure I, I agree necessarily with the concept of it. Um, at this point in time, uh, you know, uh, requires some further thought. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I suggest it. I mean, I do like how it's advocating for, you know, um, a guidance on what a full, full reopening will, you know, look like. Uh, you know, if that's a funding as well, which is obviously a huge issue. Um, I like those parts of it. And so I'll just, um, did everyone have a chance to see it via email? So it, it starts out, whereas uh, December 2019 and now coronavirus, um, was first detected causing outbreaks and so it goes into explain um, the history and where of our nation's future well-being relies on investing in the cornerstone of our democracy with high quality public education systems that prepare all students for college careers and lifelong learning and in the midst of a national national health emergency whereas our school system must be adequately funded and supported in order to prevent prolonged learning disruptions which threaten the future and well-being of our community and economy so it goes on to outline some of those things, and then it says, um, I'll skip down a little bit just for time, but where it is included in the packet, um, and everyone can access that on the website. Whereas teachers, education support professionals, other school staff who interact with students and families must have proper personal protective equipment and to help protect students, colleagues, families themselves from contracting and spreading COVID-19 and Whereas the voice of educators are critical to ensuring students on their decision making in response to the national health emergency. And whereas the safety and well being of students and educators cannot be compromised, now therefore be it resolved that the Grand Island Board of Education supports the passage of legislation um, by the Congress appropriating relief to be distributed to states and local districts to fill COVID 19 budget gaps to ensure the ongoing support of students, educators, and communities. Through the National Health Emergency, the Grand Island Board of Education, together with the Grand Island Central School District, support number one, stabilizing education funding for students in our school district. Number two, advocating for guidance or a plan from New York State um, that enables school districts to fully reopen all of our school buildings. I would take out the Erie County Health Department. I think we're dealing directly with um, New York State, and I would change Erie County to the New York State. Um, New York State, um, New York State Education, Education Department. Department. Sorry, from New York State Government and New York State um, Education Department. Be it further resolved that the Grand Island Board demands <laughs> demands Congress authorize the use of funds appropriated as part of the coronavirus response for the identification and distribution of necessary support for families, students, and community members throughout the COVID-19 crisis. Um, including mental health, um, nutritional supports, training, loss of trauma related to the pandemic and needed support for school age children, partnerships with health items, um, with health based or other organizations. And be it further resolved that the Grand Island Board of Education will continue to listen and survey stakeholders and provide feedback on plans for ongoing instruction and learning opportunities. Be it further resolved, I'm skipping down another sentence or two that the Grand Island Board of Education will continue to consult with 
and meaningfully engage the Grand Island Central School District and community to ensure that the interests of students, especially those most vulnerable, are represented in critical decision-making processes. Um, and be it further resolved that a copy of this resolution should be transmitted to our governor, to all members of our House of Representatives and Senate, representing families in our school district. Um, adopted by the Board of Education of the Grand Island Central School District, Erie County, New York, at the regular open public meeting, held this 8th day of February, 2021. So, it was my understanding that the focus of this letter was going to be demanding or wanting information on the opening of schools. So, for me, this didn't do what I thought we intended yeah. it to do. It's mentioned very briefly, the funding is over um, mm -hmm. for me. So, for me, I would like to see a redraft for really focusing on what our plan is to bring our kids back to school. At this point, you know, I, it's not what I, yeah, I'm looking to communicate. So, for me, I would not be on the redraft. Okay, well, I sent it out to everyone to comment on. So, if you want well, to just comment, I want to comment here tonight. Yep. Oh, yeah. So, but I um, also was under the impression when you were going to draft something for us. So I'm sure you could have done this much better because you're yeah, you're I, you're I, in the I, legal field. But no, I, I, I just wanted to give us something to start yeah, with. I, I feel that, as we mentioned earlier, we need to continue to advocate for you know that we want to Brian the two things we talked about at length, which are, um, uh, you know, the, the, the role that, that the state had came out and how can we advocate to, to change that or at least get an explanation on that. And secondly, is there a plan to to change things? Okay. And maybe they're the same thing. Yeah. You know, um, they may not be different things, but, 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 but certainly, you know, um, I think that, you know, what we be advocating is um, we believe that schools should be uh, reopened because 100% uh, because we think it's in the best interest of our students, if that's what we think. Okay. And secondly, that um, you know, in order to allow that to happen, we need these changes. And I mean, that's that, that's the thought of it. And 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 you know, I I think that 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 um, you know, the, the frustration as a um, uh, as a single board member is. You know, as someone said today, you know, um, you know, why don't you call Cuomo? I said, you know, a governor, I'm here. Okay, you want to call me or I call you? I'd be happy to talk to you, and I'm happy to tell you why I think what I think. I think he's hearing that from a lot of other people. Okay, um, you know, what 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 certainly has happened in other areas, and people are seeing this, is that you know, is that um, the way things are changing is is is, is that he's challenged in some way, and based upon that, that's what's resulting in changes of, of rules, okay? So the question is, what's the best method of, of challenging, you know, the education department and all those, you know, respective positions in order to, to, to facilitate change, okay? So, um, you know, uh, you know, in terms of how we advocate that, you know, whether it's, you know, the resolution is one thing, but I think that perhaps, you know, there's other people, other school districts Certainly, you're doing it from the superintendent's association to try to get that message out. So, we got to continue to try to do that. And I think, based upon everything we've heard tonight earlier, um, you know, there's a lot of people who uh, are in the school district from a parent perspective and, and the student perspective who, who believe what I just said that school should be open. So. Okay, are we still interested in? I uh, know we've mentioned, we've talked about it before at the table about passing a resolution to advocate for guidance. From New York State, is that something that we still are interested in doing as another way of advocating? In addition to the superintendent's group, um, is that something that the board would like to pursue? A resolution. I know that we've talked about it at other meetings, and that was something that the board was interested in. Is that still an interest for advocating for um, a guidance plan from New York State, or um, advocating for? Uh, Funding for the students in the district because they know at that time we were holding 20%. I don't know if that's fully been rectified or will continue to be rectified um, in terms of, you know, the 20% is definitely going to um, be stabilized. I know that we're now receiving the funds we're being held, but. Yeah, we'll definitely review that in our presentation okay. for the budget. So, um, 
I'd like, like to hear. To see the resolution more for a guy in the school. Yes, I have that in number two, definitely. Yeah. I agree. The rest of it, I think, really, the need, the funding, all of that, I think, I think the gut of what we're trying to get done here is to find out what and when we're going to finish this. Right, and Ash, I'm not knocking. I, I appreciate you taking the time to do it for us. Mm -hmm. But for me, everything else, I think the focus needs to be on when and how are we going to get it because just did. Um, that's just me as as one. And you know, the funding, all of that. You know, are really trying for five days a week. I think that's right. what we need to be able to get full, full force. I think I think in this for me, it got lost. Our main focus got lost for me. So yeah, for me, too, it was more about. Broad. The, you want more focus? Yeah, yeah like for me, it. it seemed like it was more about the funding. And then, oh, by the way, what's our guidance for these schools? Is what I took on primarily. So, for me, I would like to see the focus be, be more on bringing the kids back to school and, and what their plan is. I, I, I think that, Brian, it would, it would be helpful to perhaps we need some answers on this in the, in the short term. It is, 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 is there any indication at all that you can see in terms of your efforts that you know there might be some revisiting of the sex toys and, and mass issues that's i think as you said earlier that's the main issue okay? and and so the question would be is if that's going to change what would be the impetus to make it change okay? and if that's that can prove that you know that, that uh, you know, um, our testing is showing that the various that you know that the rates are down to such minimal levels that it makes sense, or it's showing that you know schools aren't causing spread one way or the other, so we, we can do that, or we have a certain percentage of people who are you know get their shots, whatever it might be, okay. But there should, should be something that is somebody's got to be thinking about it. I hope. So it sounds it sounds like. Dr. Brian, you and your superintendent's group are going to advocate for a seat at the table at the state of department. That's correct. Do we want to, as a board, have a resolution for Dr. Graham to take with him? Are we still interested in pursuing a resolution? And would the board like to email me their edits and changes so that I can bring back a fresh um, document that's been edited by um, the board? Anyone's free to, to mark it up, do, yeah. do whatever. I just want to make sure we're interested still in doing this before we keep forging ahead. So if we would um, put it on the next agenda, I'll resend this out again in a new email. And then if you want to mark it up and get it back to me, we can uh, pass it back and forth a bit so that when we come to the next meeting, we can hopefully have something that everyone can agree on, can um, embrace. And then um, Dr. Graham can certainly take that with him if he is allowed to seat at the table or given a seat at the table. Right. Or pass it along to other school districts to also advocate for a plan. Because I think, you know, my three asks, my three asks are in this when I drafted it, and I just wanted us to have a jumping off point. Number one was I want to make sure we have the funding to be able to stabilize education um, and have the safety precautions in place. Number two, advocate for a plan from New York State. And number three, um, just to know that our representatives are continuously planning for the safety, health, and well-being of everyone here in our school community. Because I know that parents want five days a week, they also want their kids to be safe. They want to make sure that we're thinking about the safety measures. They want to make sure that we have the funding to be able to purchase what we need, like these barriers here, so that their kids are safe. Or um, anything else that might be needed, the disinfectant. The, the additional staffing that is required to clean the buildings and the buses and that sort of thing. So I think that's why the funding is was such an came up in my draft is that I want to make sure that while we advocate for a plan, we ensure that all school districts, not just ours, but all school districts, that we're saying make sure that we can provide these things so students and teachers and faculty, and, you know, the staff is safe when they're here. We can continue to purchase what we need in order to do that. So that's it. I will look and edit that and come back to the table and hopefully have a resolution for 
Let's see that the state of department. Thank you. Okay, I think that's it. Unless anybody else, does anyone else have any comments about the draft resolution? We'll work on it. Mark it up. Feel free to send any of your questions, you know, your edits. Um, and then I'll just keep sending it back and forth and we can work on it for the next meeting. Our public comment session, general items not included in this agenda. We don't have anyone signed up for that. Um, Committee of the Whole, uh, we, before we do that, do we want to do our budget presentation? Yes. Okay. Back to the budget presentation. All right. Hey, I, I have a suggestion. You know, Ruby's going to power up our presentation. I would just like to stand up and let the blood flow a little bit because I've lost feeling in my feet. So, okay. so Ruby, while you're setting that up, I'm just going to stand. So we encourage everybody to stand. Thank you. Thank you. So Ruby, this is just a bathroom break, so thank you for getting ready. No problem.
appreciate it. All right, I think we're ready to move forward with our budget presentation. All right, Ruby, I think we're good to go. You're going to control the presentation as we share some of these slides with everybody. Okay, I just want to make sure, one, everybody can see the presentation. We can. Okay, and I want to make sure I can click through this. Okay. If I look off, it's just because I have another laptop here just because this laptop has been giving me issues. I don't know if it's internet connection. So I'm going to try to get through this and make this a quick night, sort of, kind of for everyone. As, our, <laughs> as we begin, you know, I, I, I know that many of the board members here have been with us for a bit. So we always like to talk about our mission. And our mission is to inspire all students to achieve their highest potential by fostering academic excellence, personal growth, and social responsibility. And as we move on to the next slide, you know, with these three budget goals have been in our budget presentation for five years. So I appreciate the board looking at them. They're really the same. We want to develop a long-term sustainable budget designed to provide the best diversified education program, retain the community mandated student programs and activities, and protect our fund balance. So the next uh, two slides, I, I'm not going to read them uh, individually, but it's important for the board. The board has been extremely supportive of our five-year strategic plan goals. And in particular, this board has allowed the district to add support to foster the wellness and behavioral health of our students. And then the rest of these goals, of course, have been with us uh, since the beginning of our strategic plan. So we will, you'll see those in all of our budget presentations, but I just wanted to thank the board for its support in that first strategic plan goal. So Ruby, as we look at the budget development process, obviously you have been working very hard with all of our principals, administrators, and supervisors uh, since November to put together this first draft of our presentation. Of course, we will have other presentations uh, in the future. If we can jump to the meeting dates, you'll see that of course, this is our first draft. On March 8th, we will be able to incorporate the legislative state aid projections as we have them as of March 8th. Also, at that time, we will know uh, how many teachers may be thinking about retiring. So that will impact the development of our budget. Of course, April 12th, there's a tentative budget adoption. And the 20th is the last scheduled meeting for the board to adopt the budget. And then our public hearing is the 10th of May, and on the 18th is the scheduled budget vote and board election. Unless, June, do you have any changes to that information? No changes? All right, very good. So uh, thank you for us, you know, going over those slides with us tonight. Uh, Ruby, is there anything you wanted to talk about on our agenda tonight? Nope, it's pretty, pretty regular. Uh, it's the usual stuff, so I'm going to go right to the next um, slide. Thank All right. You. Okay, so um, as many of you know, the governor's executive um, budget message came out. Um, the foundation aid is going to be maintained um, at the 2020 slash 21 school year, so our current school year, which really means it has not increased since the 2019-2020 um, school year. Uh, again, if you remember last year, there was a push, um, I'm going to say by the governor, uh, to condense expense-driven aid categories. He is again doing that. This year it's going to be called service aid. Uh, in in the uh, presentation as we move forward, but that is taking your BOCES textbook and software, library, computer, technology, and transportation aid and putting it in a service aid category. Um, the reason why I want to mention this, uh, just to reiterate to some and maybe it's new for others, is allowing them to be condensed into one category would mean that it is not 
based on the expense from year to year. It would be a lump sum of money that is given and maybe he would do increases on top of this lump sum of money, um, which really means as transportation aid uh, would use or transportation's expense will go up, BOCES expense will go up or any other um, area goes up, you're not being aided based on that increase. You're being aided based on whatever formula um, is then created to provide funding. And we have seen that uh, through the foundation aid formula, it is not favorable to Grand Island as well as Western New York school districts. Um, so it is something that we will continue to push for it not to um, take place. Uh, there was a decrease of 393 million. I always say this, it's a decrease on paper because uh, because expense-driven aid is going to be based on the reports that we file in this upcoming uh, August, September, October, and at the latest you're filing is November. So right now they're saying it's a decrease. Um, this will fluctuate as we get more information. Um, and this just again says that districts would receive a block grant in lieu of receiving separate funds for each of the consolidated. Um, and, and another thing the governor is mentioning is that by doing this, he can then focus in on foundation aid, uh, which puts money in foundation aid, but makes us short in expense driven aid categories. So it's, it's a shuffle um, and we don't want it. Um, another thing that I wanted to mention is there is a COVID-19 supplemental stimulus. Um, it, they're just changing the words around a little bit. Um, and before they had um, the pandemic adjustment, they now have the local district funding adjustment. Um, what has already occurred is state aid has been cut. And then it was backfilled by federal funding from the uh, coronavirus response and relief supplemental appropriations, which is really the six billion dollars that New York State is believed to be receiving in the future stimulus package. Um, so they are making a lot of adjustments on assumptions of what they believe the worst case will be. Um, something that I put here was supplement versus supplant. Um, if you have ever worked with federal funding, especially in the title area, we always have to supplement our program. If we are receiving federal funds, we have to add to the program. What the state is doing with the federal funds that they believe that we will receive in the worst case scenario is they're supplanting. They've already reduced what the state's obligation will be and they backfill that with federal funds. This literally is um, GEA all over again, which was the gap elimination adjustment. It's a repeat. And if we remember going back 10 years, to maybe 10 years, eight years, eight to 10 years, um, once ERA funds were done from the federal government, it created a gap in budgets. And the gover um, the state aid, when you got your runs, had a gap elimination adjustment. And basically it was saying, hey, the state owes you money, but you're not getting it right now. So figure it out, um, which was a horrible time for school districts. And that is now what is occurring again, slowly, but I, I, you, you know, you can just see the repeat um, what's happening. Um, and then the adjustment, which I'm going to show you um, on the next slide, is said to be the lesser of the COVID-19 supplemental stimulus or your projected star payment. This is the first time that people have seen star payments on um, a state aid run, and it is there now. Um, our COVID supplement is actually less then our projected star, that's why you will see the supplement amount. For some districts, it was vice versa. The star payment was less, so that's why their star and the supplement match. But this shows worst case scenario um, information that we were given, which is they would be provided $6 billion to New York State, and then they provide uh, best case scenario. But everything is built off of worst case scenario. So hopefully that's the worst case. Okay, this is just providing an overall look at the budget. Um, I did it a little bit different this year um, because as we know, 
the newspaper looks at the state aid runs and they like to give a rundown of at least Western New York and how much of an aid increase actually occurred. Um, and what I wanted to do, because uh, Dr. Graham likes to say I almost had a heart attack when that information came out, it's not accurate. Um, so I wanted to paint the proper picture so you're looking at apples to apples. Um, here you'll see an executive propose, it says 4-1-2020. That was the governor's final run in April. That was what the numbers said we were going to get. Then you will see the next column that provides you an update aid as of November of 2020. And that is for our current school year. Now, if you just look at those two columns, there's differences, right? Um, uh, uh, one area that pops out automatically is going to be, there's a difference in BOCES. There is a huge difference in the area of transportation. Remember we were in, we were in and are still in a pandemic. They're expense driven aid area. So as we don't spend money there, you're not going to get the money for that. Um, so when the new uh, forecast came out for the executive budget in January of 2021, for uh, the 21-22 school year, it looked like there were these huge increases um, in the area of transportation going from the updated aid in November to the forecasted in January, it's about $400,000 of an increase on paper. But if you look at what was said to be in the executive proposed to forecasted, it's actually a decrease. And that's why I did this, to show what's actually happening versus what it looks like when they're using um, smoke and mirrors, I guess is a good way to put it. Um, so we are actually experiencing an aid decrease from where we stand for November's aid for the 2020-21 school year and what they're forecasting for January of uh for January 21 that they just did. Um, and please remember that these are still expense driven aid areas. We're not full back, right? We haven't done all of our athletic trips. Um, kids are not coming to school at the same level that they were during normal uh, a normal school year. And spending is different. You know, um, maybe all the professional development's not happening because of how how uh, over absorbed teachers are with just trying to get um, the hybrid model down with students. Um, so as these numbers are finally filed in the months upcoming, this will look different again and I'll update the board when those numbers come in. But these are all estimates um, and the only category that is guaranteed, I would say, is foundation aid. Anything else on this um, spreadsheet can change. Um, and then here it just shows at the bottom that there's there's been no foundation aid increase since the 1920 school year. And this just reminds you how much of an increase that was. That was 86,000. Um, the highlighted areas show you what is considered now service aid. And I talk a little bit about STAR. Um, I think it is important to remember that STAR really pertains to your tax levy. So if anything starts changing in the area of STAR or um, they, the state starts manipulating the amount of STAR payment districts received, that is going to cause a huge revenue um, problem. And I believe they are trying to push the program a little bit different. So as I receive more information, I will share that with the board. Is there any questions on this one? Can you explain I think I understand it, but the local funding adjustments in the forecasting um, January 2020, is that a way for them to say we're still doing the same amount of aid, but we're taking 2.6 million away? Y yes. Um, so what that local funding adjustment is saying is where the state would have been providing the 2.6 million, they are expecting that the, um, the funds that are coming from the federal government will fill that gap. Okay, so, so the $17 million number at the, at the bottom, is that, um, it, 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 I would think, is less the 2.6 million? Yes. Yes, the $17 million is inclusive of um, 
the backfill of the 2.6 and everything else on here uh, just without the building aid. And um, just so it is noted, because as we go forward, you're going to see this building aid number change drastically. Building aid also changed last year. Um, the governor does not incorporate the fact that you may be possibly filing final cost reports in June that will then increase the amount of aid that you will get in the 2021-22 20, school year. So all, all of these numbers are going to look very different um, when we review them six months from now. Um, that's why we work with our financial advisors and our attorneys to make sure that we're just cross-checking what's going to be filed, when, how does this flow, um, to make sure we're using the correct information. Any other questions? Okay, so this next slide shows our draft tax cap. Um, see what we levied last year. Um, there are some uh, items that get included here. Uh, a couple of things to draw your attention to is you have a tax based growth factor and you also have an allowable levy growth factor. They happen to be the same uh, this year for Grand Island. That doesn't usually happen. Um, but as I'm assuming that a lot of us have heard that the uh, tax cap is called the 2% tax cap because of the allowable levy growth factor not being allowed to be more than 2%. This year it was actually 1.23%, um, which is low. And I think that's one of the reasons why we push for them to just set a percentage instead of going um, based off of CPI. Um, Another thing to take note here is the uh, capital tax levy uh, exclusion area, which is really what drives um, how much you can increase your levy from one year to the next. You will see at the bottom, you'll see $728,752. And that is significantly higher than the prior year. And the reason for that is we have our first payment for the BOCES capital project that is occurring, that has to happen um, come this upcoming school year, and the debt service cost for the $24 million project, we will have to make our first payment for that as well. So you will see um, 1.1 million of allowable increase, which is 3.26%. One thing I do want to mention is there is a BOCES component that goes into this formula. Um, I did an estimate, that way the, the formula doesn't um, come back out of whack, uh, but BOCES is supplying the actual number within the next couple of days, so I will update this. So you will see um, an updated version once I have that corrected information. So this may change slightly. Are there any questions in reference to this slide? This goes through and it shows a summary of revenues. There are a couple of things that I want to point out for you here. Um, and one of the uh, bigger areas is, like I mentioned, um, when we looked at the state building aid and it only showed, I think it was about 3.7 million, but you'll see here that I have referenced 4.65. The reason for that is the state does not take into consideration that we are finishing a capital project. Um, I worked with our financial advisors to see as long as things are filed on time, which they will be, um, what my state aid uh, in reference to building aid would be, as well as what my debt service payment um, will be. So you'll see it on the revenue side. You will also see that information on the expense side. Um, another thing to draw your attention to is the state aid for BOCES is lower than what I'm projecting for revenues. And that's because um, Cheryl has worked very hard uh, at bringing students back into the district. Um, if you remember last year, we hired someone internally instead of going through BOCES. So as those things start shifting and changing, your aid for those areas uh, changed too. And lastly, 
um, I would like to make sure it is known, though uh, it's a small reduction, it's still a reduction, um, sales tax is in jeopardy of being reduced for the current year and for next year to offset the state's general fund budget gap. Um, Erie County is being directed to send sales tax revenue to offset um, slash fund distressed provider assistance account, which is a state distressed hospital aid program. Um, I think the reason why this is important to uh, one, express and two, fight against is all school districts do not receive sales tax. Um, it's Erie County and Dr. Graham, do you remember the other county that's near us? I think it's Wyoming. Our, in, in our area, I would be only two that provide sales tax revenue to school districts. And I think as a whole um, for New York State, there might be five. So with this reduction, the districts will feel it. Um, on top of the fact that we're not even certain that we're going to get the entire amount of sales tax revenue that we thought for the school year. Um, but it's not something that is an equal share of the pie. Um, so I did want to bring that up. Any questions in reference to anything on here or what I just mentioned? So um, just looking at where we have been in prior years, um, I think this just provides a great view of where we once were when it came to state aid as a percentage of the budget and where we now are. Um, at one point we were at a place where the state was providing 34%. If we made no budgetary changes and were able to take everything and do everything, um, which if I'm gonna be honest, I don't feel there are tons of things that people are asking for outside the norm. Um, it would only be 31.76%. Um, so it's dropping, which really means that um, the taxpayers are picking up what the state is not covering. Um, so this goes into the major parts of the draft budget, and then I think I can get back to Dr. Graham. So this is a summary um, of the major expenditure areas. Uh, as always, we have salaries. That's just showing a 2.15%. Um, not much is happening in substitute. The cash um, slash credit payments seem to be working out. I don't know if it's because of COVID. Hopefully we are leveled out for good. Um, you will see health insurance is going up a little bit under 4%. You have ERS and TRS. Um, in here, TRS is shown to be 10%. We did get a new uh, percentage, so I will update that. It's a little bit less than uh, 10%. Um, you see the ERS contribution, and based on the um, estimated bill they provided, uh, we did the increase to account for that. Um, FICA really just is a percentage based on salaries. Um, until we get more information in reference to uh, retirements, uh, which I believe is due by March 1st for most, um, this is pretty stable, um, but I expect that to change. Slight increase in workers' comp, a large increase in BOCES. Um, I just wanted to make sure it's noted that for BOCES for the capital project payment, um, it is over 300,000 the first year. So that accounts for a huge chunk of that, but we will continue to review and work down. Um, an increase in debt service, and that is due to our $24 million project. Um, utilities is pretty stable. Um, some increases in gasoline and the rest is where it is. Um, people try to keep as balanced or as, as conservative as possible. So you'll see a 3.1 um, million dollar budget to budget difference. This just goes into the retirement rates. Um, it provides a nice review of the increases and the decreases um, from one year to the next um, for ERS and for TRS. Okay, and this is just providing a area by area. Um, so you can see what is happening in each either department or building. Um, as you will see the uh, 
top part for human resources is really the information that I already went through um, on the other slide. You'll see BOCES, um, not much happened at the school um, buildings. High school had a little bit of a shift between them and technology. So when I get to technology side, you'll see an increase there. And I did want to make sure it's mentioned. Um, I know we put money into the music area in reference to uniforms. Um, it is reduced for uniforms, but due to COVID and the fact that we buy um, instrument covers, there's spit cups, there's a lot of things that happen in the music area. Uh, we wanted to make sure we kept money there because we're going to need to replace things for next year in that area. Um, you will see here in the central administration, um, there is an increase listed there for COVID supplies. Um, there will still be things that need to be purchased. Uh, to cover different department areas, so that is there. Um, slight increase in physical education, as I mentioned, the movement from the high school to tech, and uh, transportations was in the area of fuel and contractual. And then you're going to see the debt service things that I've mentioned before, but this is actually showing you the shift um, between uh, principal and interest, and then ban is a bond anticipated note, which is what we're currently in for a capital project until we um, bond it. And um, nothing in the area to transfer to funds. You will see in the future slides a increase, a request for an increase for food service plan, and that's just part of the strategic plan. So that's there. And then at the very bottom, it just gives you a revenue update in reference to state aid where we would be with the um, tax levy based on the formula, but that we're waiting for BOCES information and um, the other revenue source. So right now, the budget gap is a little bit over $1.4 million. Go ahead, Dr. Graham. Thank you, Ruby. Nice job. So for our board, you're familiar with uh, our look at student enrollment over time. This uh, slide indicates that uh, last year, uh, as of April 2020, there were 2,815 students enrolled in our district. And then uh, this year, as of uh, September 2020, you'll see that there were 73 fewer students enrolled than we had the previous year. Uh, and uh, I do want to point out that the next slide shows that some families, you know, typically move into the district or move out of the district. So this chart, if you can go to the next slide, Ruby. You want me to go again? I did hit it once. Yeah, one more. Okay. Thank you. So this slide uh, shows the board some of the changes by grade level K through five. Some families just, you know, move out of the district. Some families chose homeschooling. Some chose St. Stephen's. And some chose other non-public schools. So this just gives the board, you know, some idea of some of that movement. And as we build uh, this budget and look for enrollment next year, we do anticipate if we are open uh, fully with all of our students coming to school, that there would be some additional movement. We have to plan for that. Any questions about those three slides or enrollment? Okay. So uh, slide 24 just shows a gradual decline in enrollment uh, up to this point and then projected for next year and a few years later. So of course these numbers only assume and look at the current number of students throughout our school system. So if we look at 2020, 2021, we have about 939, 940 students, but we're projecting 918 next year. That number can go up or down, uh, but it's based on, you know, the students, you know, graduating and the students coming into ninth grade. You'll see a bigger decline projected for 2022, 2023. Again, understand that this doesn't account for new home builds or people uh, moving into the district and then 2023, 2024, and 2024, 2025. So there will be a gradual decline in our secondary enrollment, and so you'll see that in the slides ahead. For slide number 25, that's our middle school enrollment. When uh, I started here, we had 700 middle school students in 6th, 7th, and 8th grade. 
about the same uh, the next year, and then a gradual decrease to about 658, 655, 651. And then next year, based on current numbers, we're looking at 636 coming into the middle school, 617 the next year, and 583 in 2023, 2024. You'll see Hughes and Kegabine combined. Uh, this year, or the 2019-2020 the, the school year, 851 students, and then a sudden drop in, in this year at 767. Next year projected at 751. And then, which is kind of nice, you're going to see a steady uh, increase in the elementaries as opposed to the secondaries with a steady decrease. Any questions about those graphs? Slide 27 is our current elementary class size ratios. Remember, when you look at this uh, graph uh, on the far left column, it indicates the class size guidelines that are contractual. Uh, when you look at this, the, first, the next three uh, columns say Sidway, number of grade level teachers, and average class size ratio. So when you look at 202, that represents kindergarten, and 196 represents first grade. Uh, you'll see that there are 10 teachers at kindergarten, 10 teachers at first grade, and the average class size is at about 20. The next column where it says youth number of students in each grade level, 75 represents second grade, 107 third, 89 fourth, and 92 fifth grade. And then you'll see also to the right under Kegabine the same number, uh, the same uh, system. So you can look at that from second through fifth. You'll see that we have class sizes that range from 18 or 19 to 23 at youth. And we have class sizes that range from 18 or 19 to 22 and a half at Kegabine. And then this uh, slide number 28 just breaks it down just overall uh, general education classrooms and the average class sizes in our buildings. Round 20 at Sidway, round 21 at Youth, and 20 to 21 at Hegabine. And overall, K-5, we're looking at an average class size of 20 throughout, that, throughout our district, K-5. Slide 29 um, just shows the Board of Education how we try to determine the number of new students coming into kindergarten. The arrow is pointing at uh, next year, where uh, this chart looks at the live births that are attributed to Grand Island five years ago and predicting an increase from the live births to a projected estimate of 220 uh, projected to be enrolled in kindergarten next year. So slide 30 uh, shows just a glimpse at projected elementary class size ratio. You'll see Sidway where that 220 folded number represents brand new kids coming to Sidway in September. And then of course the kindergarten students who move on to first grade would still be at 202. This uh, projection uh, is asking the board to consider an increase of a teacher, which we think we can handle internally to instead of 20 this year, we're looking at 21 classroom teachers, keeping class sizes as we've always have at around 20. Uh, you'll also note that at Huth, um, of the first graders that are currently in first grade now, 120 will go from Sidway to Huth, while 82 will go from Sidway to Kegabine. Does everybody see that? Okay. So, uh, this year, if you look at the bottom row, going left to right, Sidway has 20. Next year, we're asking for 21 classroom teachers. Youth has current, currently 17. We're asking for 18 in that building. And Kegabine currently has 17. We're asking for 16 in that building. So we believe we will be able to uh, move some teachers, whether they're coming out of Kegabine or sixth grade at the middle school, to accommodate the needs of uh, keeping our class sizes the same at Heath and Sidway. Any questions yet on this? Yeah. So when we look at enrollment, it's important to know that currently there are 242 sixth graders. And of course, we would expect those sixth graders to move on to seventh grade next year. Of the 242 sixth graders, we have 10 sixth grade classroom teachers at the middle school. And that is keeping our class sizes at around 24. 
We're also uh, seeing 196 current 7th graders and 213 current 8th graders. And then you'll see that the largest group in the high school is the 254 students at 11th grade. And uh, we're going to be graduating 234 uh, of our high school students. If we move on to the projected secondary enrollment, with 192 fifth graders coming into sixth grade next year, if we divide that number by eight classroom teachers as opposed to 10, we still can maintain class sizes of 24 and account for uh, some other needs at Sidway or Hugh. Any questions? So if we move on to slide 34, uh, Ruby has been including uh, a slide like this for the past few years. It just gives the board an understanding of what significantly changed in our budget presentation the year before. And you can see that we were really, you know, scrubbing our budget a year ago. Uh, so there, any of the needs that we had asked were all covered internally or covered by grants. Ruby, is there anything you want to add about this slide on slide number 34? Um, no, I think you covered it all. I, we did a lot with um, just internal and grant coverage um, that alleviated a lot of the, the stressors um, that we were foreseeing for the current school year. Um, so we're thankful for this. Thank you. So we'll go to slide uh, 35. Uh, as, as the board knows, uh, this district has a long history of working closely with principals and supervisors. Uh, hey, Mr. Corkin, I just want—I just want you to know that my laptop has just died. So hopefully you're still recording. You're good. Okay, thanks. So, um, with respect to our meetings with principals and supervisors, uh, the the board always sees the wants and needs that have been requested. So, under high school, uh, the high school team is requesting a 1.0 business teacher, a 1.0 special education teacher and a point for English language arts teacher. Uh, Ruby always puts in the cost of value of those requests. Uh, and then as we work through the budget presentations, we uh, sometimes move things to the second column and or we continuously review or look for other ways to fund those requests. So in this first draft, we have the high school request. The middle school is requesting assistance in art, technology, phys ed, and web advisor. The personnel requests there are based on the 242 current sixth graders who will be going up to seventh grade. And uh, Mr. Fitzpatrick and his team successfully uh, creating the schedule that accounts for that bubble of kids at the seventh grade level because we all know that seventh graders are required to take a language other than English as well as it's mandated for certain areas. Right now, we put a dollar value there. It's under review. Uh, it's very likely that this will change in the future as Mr. Fitzpatrick and Mr. Gloria look at uh, secondary art, technology, and phys ed and work to refine those requests. At Sidway, uh, there's a request for replacing the math AIS teacher that went away a few years ago when we had a bubble of kids enroll at Sidway. And the second piece here, you've seen a lot over the last few years, it's, it's a request for some literacy. I am going to ask the board to really consider adding a summer program for our children who have significant gaps in their learning. Bless you. And I'm going to ask that not only be a Sidway request, but a, a request for youth and Kegelbein. I think the $50,000 line item there is appropriate. I think we would be asking the board to consider a summer program for four weeks, maybe four days a week, uh, without transportation for those children that have the greatest need, uh, but keeping class sizes small. So if, if we were to do some estimating, you know, it might be nine or 10 sections at Sidley, at Hugh, and Kegabine, uh, and then we would. It would be a half day program, you know, with English and language arts and mathematics as its main structure. It would be in person, but smaller class sizes. So, would that 50,000 
right? Right now it is. We'll refine it, but but that instead of it being there, so the way in the next presentation you'll see it maybe consolidated or in each line. Okay, but we do think that is essential. We know that transportation would be uh, would just add an enormous amount of dollars. But if we can provide services like that for four weeks, four days a week, uh, we think uh, it would be in the best interest of our students. Um, there are no additional, um, you know, asks at Kegelman with respect to teachers, but, uh, you know, Mrs. Haggerty and Ms. Mrs. Palachi have, you know, continued to ask the district to consider some type of school-wide musical stipend. It was a big function at Kegelman. Of course, if we did something like that, we would want to have equity across the district, but that's, that's under review uh, for those uh, requests. And as you saw in the projected, projected uh, enrollment, we right now are projecting, you know, Mr. F Mr. Uh, Bakula is asking for two second grade teachers right now. We're estimating that it might be just one additional teacher at youth, but that will continue to be under review. Under district, um, there's a possibility that we may be able to, as a board, a governing body, consider uh, reducing some dollars on both these line for a community relations specialist that we currently budget right now for at $24,000 and perhaps, uh, you know, create a position, a part-time position here in the district to provide the same services, but uh, find somebody who can work more than one day a week uh, on a part-time basis to do, uh, to help us with everything, not only the newsletter and things like that, but true community relations uh, articles in the paper on a regular basis and things of that nature. So that right now is just a, a suggestion for the district. Cheryl Cardone and Ruby have been working hard at uh, fully comprehending how many dollars we attribute to outsourcing behavioral specialist work in the district. And right now, uh, Ruby and Cheryl are working on this and they're considering uh, reducing more of that outsourcing and uh, saving the district a significant amount of money, but also hiring a uh, behavioral therapist or behavioral specialist uh, at a significantly at a significant savings for the district. So, Cheryl will talk more about that at a future board meeting. Uh, every year, we set aside four thousand dollars for equal amendment. Uh, last year, we asked for an increase of two thousand. It's still here under review. The district is asking the board to consider. Um, uh, attributing dollars to hire a, an assistant superintendent for administrative services. Currently, we have a part-time labor relations specialist. So the dollars attributed to that part-time person would uh, be combined with new dollars to create an assistant superintendent of administrative services that would focus on human resources and curriculum instruction and assessment. And if possible, uh, to support the curriculum department would be wonderful to have a teacher on special assignment supporting that department. Uh, so that is also under review. Any questions about those recommendations or suggestions or asks? I have a question. Sure. Um, have there been any conversations or consideration given to increasing um, support for mental health? Um, I'm just asking, you know, we heard a lot from our community members today, um, and I think we might have a large community ones for their school program, so I don't know if it's a better competition. It's great. It's just kind of, you know, my kind of suggestion. I'm not, you know, normally we see some of that on the board in the community. Yeah, no, that's a good suggestion. We'll definitely work internally to see how that can be developed, whether it's through grants or an add to the budget. Cheryl, I'm sure you're taking a note on that. Yes, I am. Thank Thank you. You. you know, I just worry that you know, this thing I've told you probably Thank you. So uh, moving on to slide 36, you will see the traditional items that you've seen in the past. 
uh, some new things, uh, some are related to software programs that have been suggested for add-ons, uh, others are requests for painting. Uh, the Buildings and Grounds Department has three requests uh, to increase clerk typist by 0.5, to add uh, two labor uh, specialists, laborer specialists, and one maintenance mechanic and one custodian. Uh, You'll also see on here, we removed last year the small capital outlay project so that as returned as a request to put back into the budget and buildings and grounds is also asking for us to consider uh, hiring more part-time cleaners. So we'll work through those. We'll be in general work through those and we'll have some refinements in future uh, budget presentations. Additionally, you'll see some other requests, whether they're um, Instructional technology requests and a, and a replacement plan to move out old smart boards uh, and replace with the high-tech uh, touchscreen TVs that we've had uh, in many classrooms. A request to have better integration between our Infinite Campus Student Management System and linking that in a better way to our food service uh, department. So there's a module that I think Infinite Campus offers that the district is recommending us purchase about $20,000. Uh, every year we are replacing and upgrading our security cameras, so you'll see that on here. And there is something on the E-Rate project, Ruby, that uh, looks to be kind of expensive, so maybe you want to just touch on that a tad. Sorry, I'm muting and unmuting. Robin says there's some feedback going on. Um, so uh, we I believe it was a year or two ago, um, began the process of trying to work with BOCES on um, a need for new switches and Wi-Fi. Um, I do like to put that information on here so the board knows it is um, up for discussion on the BOCES end. Um, I will work with Robin to get a full comprehensive plan before the board so you understand what occurs in that. Um, that's why it's not fully added in there um, because we're, we're working with BOCES to kind of get the logistics. It is something that has to happen. I just am trying to see if it can be done over a two year. Is it like um, other projects where it's spread over five years? There's still a couple of unknowns right now. All right, thank you, Ruby. And then to conclude this slide, um, for the past few years, uh, Teresa Lizade has requested the district to consider adding more dollars in the budget to support uh, more of the drivers and bus aides to have uh, health insurance. So you'll see that that has been on here in the past and it's on here again this year. Uh, last year, we had a request to uh, hire two more part-time school resource officers, so increasing our budget uh, for school resource officers uh, or doubling that budget. So that request is still on here at this point in time. Uh, Ruby has been asking the board to allow the district to transfer dollars into food service to reduce the uh, overall loss in the food service department. So that'll be on here and we'll continue to review that. And I think uh, for the past few years, you've seen modified soccer. Uh, we've had some people, I think, talk to the board about it and that is on here as well. Any questions about those requests? I have a question about the part-time assistant superintendent. Is the 87,000 budget for that, um, that doesn't include what we currently spend now on the part-time person, so it would be 87 plus what we... Yep, it would, be, it would be combined, and it wouldn't be uh, 160,000 or, you know, okay. it would, the reason why the, the request is there, because it would include benefits. So it's salary benefits plus the dollars that are attributed to the current part-time person would all be combined as one, uh, one posting. Thank you. And Ruby, if you want to talk about the proposition for uh, vehicles. Sure, I'm just acting like a magician a little bit. Hold on. Okay, um, so on here you will see a proposition for um, the bus replacements. Um, you will also see, so you see the 65 passenger buses, um, the 29 passenger bus, 
uh, the new item you're seeing this year is our Suburban. Um, in the next presentation, I will uh, put some pictures in here or I can send them um, separately or put it as information for the board in reference to our current Suburban. Um, there is a lot of rust and um, undercarriage damage, um, you'll see that in pictures. Uh, so they, the transportation director, Teresa Lizade, is doing a request um, to purchase a new uh, truck Suburban, um, which is, it's like a smaller bus. I'll show a picture of that as well in the future. Um, and then we have the buildings and grounds requests. Usually they are requesting two uh, Ford F-350s. Um, this year the request is for one um, and then one Ford Transit 150 wagon. Um, and this would replace the fact that uh, we lost a delivery van. So we did go an entire school year without it and tried to make any type of accommodations or sharing of vehicles. Um, but the uh, buildings and grounds director, uh, Jim Rosler is putting a request in and to keep it leveled, he's just saying, hey, instead of me getting two of the F-350s, um, I can hold off on doing one of them and, and try to get this uh, wagon for that vehicle. Um, so what you will see here is the 2021 budget of 685,000 and what is requested for the 21-22 is 710,000. Another thing I always like to make sure is remembered is the impact is always going to be on the next budget year. So if you won't see on um, the actual dollar increase until the 22-23 school year. Can you just remind me what the use of the Suburban is for? The Suburban, um, I, I drove our current Suburban um, in reference to needing to take uh, a person to a place. I know um, any type of smaller, maybe you only have one student or two students that are maybe they're off island um, transportations, you could use it for those type of things as well. Um, I cannot remember currently how many children it can fit, but I can collect that information. Um, I do know that just thinking about the way the rows is, I'm almost positive there's an additional two rows behind where I would be, um, but I can collect information so you can know for sure um, how often it's used, uh, as well as here it shows that we've had our current one since 2009. Um, so I can write that down. Thank you. Not a problem. And Jude and I got a chance to drive it down to the Board of Elections at 3 a.m. <laughs> last year, so that was fun. Yes. So, um, Ruby, if you're okay, we can go to slide 38 and you can just give a, a recap. Yes. Um, so this is just a recap of everything you have heard on the financial end tonight. Um, just broken into some overarching categories. So you'll see all the revenue store sources. It gives you the total amount of revenue before tax levy. It shows you all of the expense areas, which we do as salaries, benefits, and other costs. Um, and then it gives you the total expenses, which is the 67.8 million. Um, anticipated tax levy is if it just all worked out perfectly tax levy maximum increase is the allowable uh, levy limit with the um, information we have thus far. So you'll see without any request, uh, just budget to budget things, it was uh, a gap of 1.47 million. And with the request included, that gap becomes 2.89 um, million as usual. Uh, we will be working hard, myself and Dr. Graham and, and all of um, our great administrators, um, to see what is um, needed and, and what we can, you know, maybe put on the back burner for a future year. And then we will be bringing um, another presentation before you. And then this is just really going over again what Dr. Graham already mentioned about the dates um, for upcoming meetings, regular meetings, and when the vote is. Thank you, Ruby. So that's the first half of our budget presentation this evening. We will now go into the second half. No, I'm just kidding. 
there aren't any questions, and in a few weeks we'll have another presentation. All right, and now we're ready for committee of the whole and information for the roundtable, beginning with Jay. Okay, cool. Okay. Good. Um, the good news One. Is next year, Monday after Super Bowl, we will have no school. And I'll have waiting. <laughs> <laughs> Joy? I'm all set, thank you. Uh, hey, Robin? I'm good, thanks. Hey, Cheryl? And Cheryl Ruby, anything else for the round yep. Oh, sorry. Yes, I was trying to unmute. Um, just to answer Sue's question, um, and I can get into it more um, once we're done with budget season. But Sue, uh, Jessica Hutchings, and I, we did um, apply for a mental health grant um, through Horizons, and it actually is training um, our current faculty and staff. Um, to note, to notice, and to actually look for uh, mental health, you know, issues going on with our faculty, staff, and students, and it's actually a five-year rollout plan. So after budget season is over, um, I will probably ask Dr. Graham if I can bring um, Jessica and myself to the board so that we can give you just a short presentation on that grant going forward. That's great. Thank you. Congratulations. Thanks. I just have um, one thing. Ruby? Nothing. Nothing. Okay. So okay. Um, I just have uh, given our budget presentation, uh, the budget gap, the redirection, sales tax, foundation aid. I just think funding is going to be a huge issue. So as we look at our resolution, um, just to board to keep that in mind as we're passing it back and forth, that funding is just going to be a huge issue for districts across the state. And um, some advocacy and a resolution for funding might not could not be a bad idea given the budget report we just had. And thank you everyone for um, sticking with us. I also wanted to ask um, Cheryl if we could have any mental health programming through the Family Resource Center. If we could um, hear about that. I don't know if there's anything um, going on with that um, virtually or any other way. And then. Oops. So yeah, at a future meeting. Yeah. At a, oh, at a future. Okay, at a future meeting. Well, I I will say that I stayed at the wellness committee, so I will make sure that um, I gather that data as well. Okay, thank you. And if I can have a motion, then oh, I'm sorry, Dr. Graham. I cut, I just cut you right off. So no, I'm I just, the clock and I'm not thinking. I just want to thank all of the people who shared their concerns with us tonight. I also want to ask for thank. Mark and Robin for uh, working through some of the tech issues in the overflow room, and I hope everybody has a great evening. Yes, thank you, Mark. Thank you, Robin. Um, if I can have a motion to adjourn 1105. I have a motion. All in favor. Uh, Aye. 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 No. <laughs> <laughs>